on behalf of uh, Department of Prosthodontics, uh, KSR, IDSR, I wish to welcome all the speakers and all the participants. Uh, I wish to thank the management as well as the principal for giving us all the support for conducting the CD program. And, uh, before I start off, uh, maybe on a formal note, I just want to be a little uh, casual and uh, uh, go back in time. So maybe go back to 1989 when I missed, uh, met the first speaker, uh, Dr. Prakash. I joined as my uh, batsmith in Annamalai University, uh, the bats of uh, Untouchables. And uh, then he went on to be, become my uh, teacher also. And then uh, 10 years down the line, uh, I joined my post-graduation 1999, very important year. And then I met the second speaker, Dr. Vinod. Uh, but uh, the first speaker didn't leave us there. <laughs> he joined again as a teacher to both of us and uh, was a taskmaster. So he didn't leave us there. So he said, why should I alone take the classes? No, you guys also take the class. So me and Vinod, we took classes for the third speaker. <laughs> so we took a few classes for uh, Sindhil. Uh, but then uh, teachers don't remain teachers all the time. Again, 10 years down the line, I think somewhere around 2009 or 2010, uh, Sindhil became, Sindhil and Vinod became my teachers. Right? <laughs> so learned from all of them. And uh, uh, I think somewhere uh, one and a half years after uh, two, uh, 1999, maybe around 2001 or 2002, uh, the fifth person joined us. None other, none other than our uh, beloved principal, uh, Dr. Sharad Ashokan. Uh, he also joined in Pinakshiyapa as a staff. Uh, so I think at this juncture, I would uh, wish to invite uh, Dr. Sharad Ashokan uh, to say a few words. Uh, Sharad, please go ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, very good morning to everyone here. Uh, at the outset, I would like to congratulate uh, Matthew, sir, and his team, uh, Department of Prosthodontics for organizing such an event. I'm sure all the uh, delegates and participants are going to uh, have a great time uh, listening to all the three uh, speakers who are experts in this field. Uh, actually, I wanted to uh, talk something informal, which I have not done in any CD program so far, uh, especially for this program, because I think what connects all the speakers here, Matthew, sir, and me here, is Meenakshi Amal Dental College. And uh, obviously, we cannot forget the person involved, Naidu, sir. Uh, with fond remembrances of sir on this particular occasion. Uh, I think I date back to 1995, sir. Uh, you started in 89. I go back with 95 when Prakash sir started teaching my first year BDS and uh, then went on till about uh, uh, till 99 when I was in my final year BDS. Uh, when you would uh, probably look at the impressions and say 30%, 40% and uh, uh, repeat the impressions and we were probably sitting there uh, till five o'clock six o'clock in the evening uh, working in the prosthetic department and he's sitting with the typewriter in the in the in the hostel that was a great time and i i, I wanted to do prosthodontics uh, uh, desperately in my life because of two reasons one dr naidu sir who was my mentor who uh, brought me into dentistry as such and second because of prakash sir because when i joined uh, the prosthetic department i think i was sitting in some of your seminars with uh, matthew sir and vinod sir I still remembering, uh, uh, knowing some answers because of this great gentleman, Dr. Prakash, because he used to conduct fill up the blinds, asked me to read something below the pictures in the surveyor. Uh, there's something which is there only in that uh, below the picture, asking about how to remove zincopsid eugenol with orange oil and all these things. So I still remember something in Prosto, and I remember in my exam, I talked about Atwood's classification, and I was screwed right royally by the external examiner asking me whether are you a PG or a UG examiner, are you thinking you're smart? <laughs> Thanks to Dr. Prakash for making me behave like one PG at that time. And uh, Vinod sir, I think we go a long way with, uh, again, when Matthew sir and Vinod sir was uh, there uh, treating my mother, I think I, I still remember doing that. And Prakash sir lying in the uh, Prosto lab the nights and torturing both his classmate Matthew sir and Vinod sir through the days. And whenever we had to think about Sabarimala trip with uh, Naidu sir and the clinic time we had, it was always great time uh, with Vinod sir also uh, in Naidu sir's clinic. And about mm. Sendhal, I, I, I definitely have to tell uh, one uh, thing. His characteristic smile and giggle, which I don't know whether he still has that. I, yeah. I still remember when I joined uh, Prosthodontics department, he was in his final year, just about to go for exams. 
and everybody in the processor department especially because i was a tutor then everybody be used to be very irritated with this particular guy because this fellow if in case this class is going on this direction he'll be turning that side and uh, all the tutors there would want to pick on sendhil because he was not probably listening and this guy is a very smart person so he gets up to answer everything which a teacher would not know and and uh, it's been a long way with him uh, he's he's given a great fight uh, on his health reasons also i know him personally he went on to do the diploma uh, in the prosto and uh, working with him in uh, nidusas clinic it was great fun uh, somehow somehow i think if i had not done pedo uh, and uh, i never wanted to do ortho i had ortho i think i should put it off record but then uh, if it was not uh, pedo and if i had ortho uh, prosto definitely i would have done prosto in meenakshi i would have been one of the alumni of uh, uh, meenakshi mal dental college i'm very glad to be amongst you and i'm actually honored to be among uh, among this uh, august uh, crowd and i i i'm sure this uh, program is going to be a great success uh, thank you sir for giving this opportunity over to matthew sir thank, thank you sir thank you. and thanks thank to you. the speakers for joining us today. thank, thank you. you thank you thank you so much uh, thank you sir professor uh, for the wonderful memories that we had uh, i i think the speakers would have also had a good time listening to them <laughs> yeah so uh, Uh, going on to the program, we actually have uh, three speakers and uh, three different topics: one on occlusion, one on implants, and uh, uh, one on the uh, prosthodontic uh, skill sets that you are supposed to know, the contemporary skills that you are supposed to know. Uh, so, three different topics, and uh, all three of them have taught me. So, I, I thought uh, it's good enough to have them as uh, speakers also. And uh, before we uh, just go into the uh, actual introduction. i would just request all of them especially on the zoom platform once the speaker starts to uh, go ahead uh, with the speech if you could just uh, mute yourselves and then we would have a question and answer session later after each uh, topic is over and uh, at that time maybe you can un unmute yourselves and ask the question or you can put it on the chat box and uh, people on the youtube link could put it on the chat box and we'll have the uh, discussion there and uh, Uh, we have a link that is going to be put uh, both in the youtube as well as the uh, zoom uh, platform uh, a feedback link which we would uh, ask you to fill up and send it to us that would be of uh, great help to us so i think we would just start off uh, by uh, introducing the first speaker i request uh, dr rajaganeshan uh, senior lecturer department of prosthodontics to go ahead rajaganeshan yeah thank you sir uh it's my pleasure to introduce our first for today's session dr r prakash professor and uh, head of the department of prosthodontics in anil neerkonda institute of dental science vijayak he completed his uh, undergraduate and postgraduate from uh, anamalai university and he is a key opinion leader for uh, international manufacturers like sabre dental garris and dental solution template corporations etc and he is also a reviewer for the journal of uh, dental education and a board member of the postgraduate board of studies ntr university of health science we are happy to have you with us sir looking forward for your enlightening session on occlusal concept compass concept thank you sir yes prakash yes i'll take over yeah, just yeah you can take over yes till this uh, you can share your slides just yes please take out the okay. Just give me a second. Okay, so I'll start sharing my screen now. So this just double checking that you can all see my screen. Yeah, we are able to see and hear you. Wonderful, wonderful. So uh, it's. awesome being amongst great friends today uh, to talk on a slightly strange topic to lap slightly into tamil as a language chinna da kadiya podnu iniki it's like going to be a little bit of a, a strange topic so you have to bear with me and uh, we got to shed a little strange light on to the most terrifying topic for youngsters which is your occlusion so now if we take a look at how the jaw moves the jaw moves in its three directions the dimensions as your transverse your tcs axis is fine so when you look at the movements poselt has put forth what you call the envelope of motion now what we normally do is we do not look at this 
as just simple movements, but as color coordinated directions. So you notice that in person's envelope below, you have a black line which indicates the forward protrusive. You have the Prakash, red line. Prakash, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Can we yes, just please. can we just mute everyone and can you unmute yourself then? Later? Yes, please. I think there's some interest. Yeah, you can unmute yourself now. Yes. yes. So I hope things are fine now. Yes. Yes. So to start Thank off you. once again, it's awesome being amongst close friends and a lovely audience for today. As we look into one of the strangest topics that usually plagues us during our uh, post-graduation and even to an extent undergraduation. Uh, ask anyone who is still a student what occlusion is. They'll just tell you in Tamil, buying a kadi. So the thing is, we're trying to make this a little less uh, boring and a little bit more exciting with today's topic. So what is the occlusal compass? It is basically a coordinate of your directions, which are color coordinated. So let us first take a look at your mandibular movements. When you look at the mandibular movements in the three axes, you'll notice that it moves within the confines of what Purcell has called the envelope of motion. And if you try to color coordinate these particular movements, one could label, for example, your backward, slight backward movement, the retrusion in red, the movement towards the front, the protrusion as black, and the sideward movements could be given other colors as well. So this is the starting point of what we'll be discussing today, that if you have your morphology of the teeth determined and influenced by these border movements that the mandible is undertaking, shouldn't we know how exactly the morphology is influenced and what these movements mean and what their influences are? So to go on a little further, if we examine how the interplay of cuspal surfaces takes place between the upper jaw and the lower jaw, you will notice that you basically have your working side, the side to which you move. And the other side which swings along the non-working side, it just joins in very lazily and casually. So you have your working side and your non-working side as your main cusps, the functional cusps come into interaction. So the cusps have been given colors here. You have your red and blue. Think of it as a red pen marking off the lines that it makes on the opposing cusp in movement. So you can see here during the various parts of protrusive, retrusive, and side to side, it is almost as if the cusp of the top is like a marker pen marking off various movements on its opposing uh, to tooth surface, the occlusal surface. So we call these Antagonist, antagonistic cusps and these are movements which are marked off and are extremely significant in their length of travel and angle of travel and the direction of travel. So what you'll have to try understanding here is that there is a per particular cuspal angulation, a particular path, a particular direction and a particular distance. So we've seen this for one particular type of movement. So you've seen how this cusp is marking off the various directions on its opposing counterpart. So now if you go on and see how this is taking place in the whole arch as such, in one quadrant, you have similar marking taking place on the teeth during all the movements in fossil's envelope of motion. And the same thing would occur. Suppose now we again consider your working side and your non-working side. But if you're looking at what happens the other way around. So as we've seen earlier, you have two color codes. So you have the red dot and the blue dot. So we've assumed that one is marking on the other. So if you were to look at it the other way around, taking a look at the blue line in the sense that your mandibular cusp blue is now going to mark off on the occlusal surface of the maxilla. What we saw earlier was the marking of the maxilla on the mandible. So the right lateral path followed by the left lateral path, followed by your protrusion and then your retrusion. So here what is happening is the mandibular functional cusp is doing its marking on the opposite side. So what is of significance for us is, if one cusp has to work properly and efficiently, you need to have the proper space, the proper shape, the proper slopes, and the guidances on the opposite tooth. And that is what occlusion is all about, because 
it is not just the contact which we say in a static way occlusion it is a dynamics as articulation as to how the teeth come into contact your occlusion and how they get out of it the disocclusion you have a few milliseconds in which the food is being tightly squeezed together and it is most important that you have escape points on the side of these cusps for the crushed food to escape out so this is the basis of what we have in your occlusion as such and now if we go on further you could mark these particular directions that we just saw into your working side into your non working side or your balancing side along with the protrusion and your retrusion for starters so you end up with few lines as you can see on the screen in the picture you have a yellow line you have a blue line you have a red line you have the lines indicating each particular type of movement color coded we're going slowly into the topic now so the same thing here on the opposite tooth that you have your your green line indicating a working in this color coded picture your balancing movements at a sloped angle in red your protrusive in its uh, blue and the yellow as your retrusive so we're just going slowly that each person comes up with various colors to be chosen for the same uh, notation now if this is again looked at as the mandible swinging towards one side so the blue would be a straight movement towards the working side followed by a lazy drifting of the non working side the effect seen on the maxillary cusp is that you have the movement taking place in the same direction whereas on the mandible when you're moving your jaw towards one side the the movement effect is of the opposite cusp on it in the opposite direction as you can see by the blue lines marked below on the mandibular cusp and the green on the mandible so it's like in the opposite way that it happens because we are trying to talk about the influence of the antagonistic cusps so if i am moving my mandible towards as you can see on your screen suppose you are moving it to that particular side now as the jaw is moving towards that side the upper cusp is actually rubbing on it creating a line in the opposite direction much similar to how you would see in your gothikar tracing that things come in the reverse way slightly so the same sort of thing here that you are having a marking so we've gotten now an idea that if your cusp were more like a marker if you are getting markings by way of your cusp on the opposing occlusal surface you would be able to elicit certain markings for example now a protrusion and retrusion would be a straight forward and a straight backward that's pretty clear but the uh, interesting part about your functional working movement towards one side is it's straight out whereas the non functional movement is more as a slope you have a difference in the angulation fine so we move on to our next slide here that what was originally proposed by poles and made popular by a german called dieter schulz you have here as what is called a uh, anatomic type of wax up called the nat in which you have every single cusp being color coded with certain number of contacts so the main emphasis here is to be able to divide each tooth by way of its function as attributed by the antagonistic cusp how is the opposite cusp moving on the surface so what is the significance of for example a mesio buccal cusp or a mesio palatal cusp of what particular tooth so these are what were laid down and again as you can see here if you take into consideration how the movements take place the movements have even if you take of it think of it as four basic movements the four basic movements in their color coordination have a particular way of affecting how the movements take place on each tooth by way of the antagonistic cusp rubbing along the grooves in a particular direction see the main thing is to understand to go back to your basics to go back to your tooth morphology to understand that number one each cusp is not just a triangular pyramid it is like a trilobe structure where there are escape ways for food to escape out so the first thing is to be able to look at those intricate features especially on the cast of young people with untreated teeth it could be anywhere between 18 to 30 years of age examine those cars and take a look at the occlusal surfaces number 1 number 2 is to be able to understand the difference between your functional cars which are more rounded off because they have to do the crushing of food as against the more prominent non functional cars which act more like pillars to support keep the cheek away keep the keep the tongue away during the chewing movements allowing this mortar pestle grinding to take place and in between you have these various grooves in various particular directions 
allowing the opposite functional cusp to move. And this is what is marked here in this picture and the next picture. So you have these, and as you come forward, you'll see the influence starts wearing off towards the front, towards the anteriors. So you're going to essentially chew and masticate more with the posterior teeth. In most young individuals, there's going to be a certain degree of the canine coming to play for the canine guidance. And then towards the incising units, it's mainly the effect of the protrusion that you would see over there, right? So that's how it goes. Now, you would also want to know that the steepness of your cuspal forms varies from back to front. As you can see, you would have a very steep sort of overlap towards the front with your incisors and the anglation slowly goes down. And the same is influenced by your various compensatory curves. So the way that the cusps are made, there are various parameters for the cuspal height and their angulations. That is beyond the scope of, the, of what we're discussing today, but yes. Now, when you look at your opposing contacts, you can have two types of contacts. You can have your cusp, your functional cusp, going into the opposing fossa. This would be referred to as a cusp to fossa type of contact. You can also have a cusp to marginal ridge type of a configuration where your cusp is sitting in the opposing fossa and you might have contact with the marginal ridge as well. So the first thing, the cusp to fossa is referred to as a tooth to tooth. It's a single tooth against a single tooth, a tooth to tooth type of a contact scenario. Whereas your cusp to marginal ridge is referred to as a tooth to two teeth. Now, when you look at your cusp to fossa, it is a single cusp aimed at the central part of the fossa. So the force is exerted along the long axis of that particular opposing tooth with the least amount of sideward stresses being exerted during the masticatory cycle. Whereas if you look at your cusp to marginal ridge, it is seen in almost all adults. And thereby, if you're talking about any restoration, which is like a single individual restoration, it is by default what one would go about giving or what a lab may end up giving you because you're just mimicking what is there in nature. Coming to your cusp to fossa, it is not seen in nature. You are using it for the purpose of rehabilitation to limit the type of torquing and lateral forces. And this is used when rehabilitating multiple teeth. This would be ideal in a full mouth re rehabilitation situation. Now, the problem with your cusp to marginal ridge situation, especially when you're trying to rehabilitate using that is, if you were to place a functional cusp into a lingual embrasure, the squeezing effect may cause food impaction or the tight downward movement may actually cause a slight opening of the teeth down below a tooth movement. But then again, yes, it is what could that could be used for single restorations, individual restorations. Now, when you talk about the contacts of your the teeth on your, on your opposing surfaces, you can have what is called a tripodal contacts. The tripodal contacts would be the most popular system that is being used for education is still what PK Thomas has proposed. So you can see here that you have approximately 84 contacts that are there as designated on the pointer teeth. And this would be as per PK Thomas's system. So this would be your PK Thomas type of a contact scenario of opposing contacts with your 84 contacts existing in the posterior teeth. Now, by contrast, you have two other researchers, Payne and Lundin, who have given this sort of a configuration where you end up with 58 contacts. So now comes your curiosity. If you're talking about what has been proposed by Poles and your data shows uh, in the occlusal compass theory, where exactly are the contacts and where are they located? Is it of any significance to us? So we'll go to that a little while later. Let us first get our color coordination a little bit regularized. So your central fossa contact is normally marked off in red, just for you to understand where you're planning on having on the tooth, the contact of the opposing cusp. To a certain extent, with a mild significance, it would be nice to know that small retrusion movement, what amount of play can you give the cusp, a certain amount of freedom for its movement, and a small amount of sideward movement in the immediate side shift. So these are normally marked in red, as you can see those lines above. Then you have your bang straight movement towards the working side would be in blue. This is referred to as lateral trusion, your blue working side movement. This is followed by a very lazy movement of the opposite side as media trusion. You have to understand that when one tooth is undergoing its working, it's normally the contralateral side that gives you your balance. So there on the other side, you see your media trusion, but every tooth has a balancing component. Now, what if you were to move forward? The forward would be black. 
backward retrusion would be red. What if we were to you move towards the midline and forward towards the outside, towards lateral and forward? These would be referred to as lateral protrusion and medial protrusion. So you have these colors as your yellow and your orange. So this forms the basis that whichever tooth it is that we're trying to look at, you need to have this color coordinated compass overlaid, superimposed over your tooth to try and understand where the opposing or antagonistic cusp is moving and what sort of functions of mandibular movement are reflected in those particular contacts and movements. So if we go on to this, this is how you would superimpose the occlusal compass onto a tooth and you could use whatever colors you have with you as long as you're remembering to divide each segment of the tooth's occlusal surface as per function. So that's what's being done over here that every particular cusp has got its individual identity as far as movements are concerned. Where, for example, the blue component is allowing sideward movement, your lateral protrusion. The green component, when the other side is actually rubbing against each other, causes your uh, support over there as your medial protrusion. Fine. And then you have your lateral protrusion as the yellow. Your protrusion, which could be in black, is colored in a slightly beige color over here. So we will move on a little bit further to your molar to give you another idea here that what you see in red is where the upper maxillary functional cusp is sitting in the fossa. You have your blue referring to your lateral protrusion, your green referring to your medial protrusion, you have your yellow, you have your protrusion. So for you to get the basic idea, you're starting to understand that we use color coordinates, that each part of the occlusal surface has to be color coordinated. Your working movements are in blue. You refer to that as lateral protrusion and so on and so forth. So the same thing applies as you go on further. If you see, you only have the effect of pure protrusion towards the front. So for example, you have only the black reflected on the incisors. A certain amount of the uh, lateral protrusion would be obvious on the lateral incisor. Fine. And thereafter, the canine takes over the duties. So you have the impact of these movements on the teeth as well. So coming back to how your compass would be overlaid on a tooth, you have the working side movement referred to as lateral protrusion visible here as LT, the line starting from the center of the tooth upwards. And then you have that wide area where you have the lateral protrusion in yellow. You have a forward backward line for the protrusion in black. You have an orange line indicating the meteor, me, mesial protrusion where it moves again forward but at an angle. And then the medial protrusion, which is your balancing movement in the green empty. The immediate side shift as your ISS and the retrusion as your red grid areas. These are tiny movements, tiny movements. So these are not very significant. You don't have to get scared about them when you're starting off with your initial patterns. Just remember them as the space provided there for these particular movements. Now, you should also understand, there's a very crazy thought here that, see, as it is, we fail to realize that when the jaw is functioning for mastication, that there are teeth. And these teeth have got cusps and probably each cusp can be color coordinated. Now, when you look at each area of the tooth, each area of the tooth is being influenced by the axillary compress as well. It's more like now uh, where each individual, suppose if I were to hold an ordinary magnetic compass, I will be able to visualize the north, south, east and west. So would Dr. Matthew, so would Dr. Vinod. So the same thing here. Every cusp would have the influences of these movements being affected on the shapes of the trigone of the cusp, the three sides of the cusp. So when you finally finish a color coordinated wax pattern based upon these rules, you would be having something which looks like this, that the functional movements would be in blue. And then you have that as the lateral protrusion of the opposing cusp taking place over there. So if you look on my screen towards the right hand side, I have a decorative compass like picture there, which shows you here, for example, blue towards the top. And then you have your yellow as your lateral protrusion in yellow. You have the green for the balancing type of a movement. So you're seeing that that has been overlaid in wax, just that the protrusion movement, instead of it being in black, the wax chosen over here is in gray. So it is to be able to understand how to divide your cusps and color code them as per the movements of the opposite tooth on them. That is, we're talking about the movement of the antagonistic cusp onto these particular surfaces.
So again, the same thing, when you look at the broader picture, when you're having your protrusion forward, how towards the lateral incisor, you have the effect of the lateral protrusion. And then towards your working side, you have got your lateral protrusion seen in blue. So this is again, how you have the overall picture of what movements are taking place. And the grid superimposed on the molars for you to have an idea about how exactly the occlusal compass with its various coordinates of the retrusion, lateral protrusion, lateral protrusion, annual protrusion, and the medial protrusion, and then the various things, how they work. Now, if we take a look at it in segments, see, this is how your starting example would be that a magnified view of the molar as such would show you the molar. And the red dot indicates where the functional cusp of the maxilla is seated, seated on that particular maxillary molar. Now, imagine if I'm moving this mandible forward. If I move it forward, what happens to the maxillary cusp? It is moving tentatively, as in imagination, backward. So if the upper cusp were to be a pen marker in black, it is drawing a backward line in black, which in protrusion is seen as the occlusal compasses line black going backwards. So the same thing here in this picture, if you notice, although the condyle and the mandible are moving forward, the effect of the antagonistic maxillary cusp on the occlusal surface of the molar down below is to draw a line backward for protrusion. So you have the backward line for the mandibular molar and a forward protrusive line for the maxilla. So whatever you're talking about as a movement is in its true direction for the maxilla, not for the mandible. If I'm saying protrusion, it's as if I'm protruding the maxilla forward in terms of antagonistic markings. Now, same thing over here. If you're protruding your mandible forward, you can notice that as it moves forward, the maxilla is marking a line in the opposite direction as seen in the pictures here in B and C. So you have to understand that the antagonistic cusp contacts are in the opposite direction. Now, what if you're working, moving towards the working side? So you're trying to move towards the working side, which is your lateral protrusion. And when you move towards your working side, you will notice that it works in the opposite direction that your maxillary cusp is giving a marking towards the opposite side, which is labeled in blue over here, your lateral protrusion or your functional side movement, your working movement, right? Now the same thing, suppose you're moving slightly to the side, but forward, you refer to this as lateral to the side, protrusion forward. So lateral protrusion, if you remember your color coordinates is in yellow. So you're moving towards the side and you're moving slightly forward. So towards the side and forward would give you this yellow dotted line over here and this entire cusp, which is marked in yellow now because you're doing the lateral protrusion. So we've seen your protrusive movement. You've seen your lateral protrusion towards the working side. And then now you've seen your lateral protrusion. Now, moving on to your next movement, what if you're doing the medial protrusion, which means as the other side is undergoing working, you are giving your balance to that side by way of medial protrusion. And this, if you remember your color coordinates, is the green line which lazily uh, shifts, meaning that your mandible is just arcing gracefully in the direction of the working side. So you have a nice lazy slope of that green line, which affects the cusp colored in green over here. So you've seen that you now understand which cusp is significant in its effect of bearing the contacts during the non-working side movement of the maxillary cusp. Now, if you're moving towards the midline, but slightly forward, this would be referred to as medio and protrusion, medial protrusion. And this would be as per the universally accepted color scheme now, it would be the orange line. So you would see over here that it slightly falls upon the tiny cusp towards the back of the molar that, that is facilitating the movements. That's facilitating the movements there. Now, again, for you to understand once again, depending upon the side that you're talking about, suppose on your screen, you're seeing one side, the movement taking place as bang, the mandible is moving towards that side as working. At a slope, the other side curves down, arcs down in what is called a balancing movement, the medial protrusion. So you have your bang movement of blue with a arced angular movement of your medial protrusion. And the same thing for the opposite side as well, just for comparison, just for comparison, seeing it on both sides. So we've seen one side here and what if it to take place in the other direction, it would be like that. So you've seen here that depending upon how you move it, when you move towards the side, your mandible almost just moves 
whereas the other side has to come down and it is moving inwards it like arcs so when you're having that you have your lines as you can see towards the bottom of both sides on the right you have a tiny blue line you have a tiny green line indicating the straight movement and the angulated movements of movement so once again here your functional movements in blue depending upon the tooth that you're talking about and the antagonistic cusp how it draws the particular uh, direction on it and the same thing as your balancing movements as ascribed by the balancing contacts made by the antagonistic cusps so you've seen here that you're considering that each functional cusp that you're considering is like a marker pen with a specific color during a particular movement in a particular direction so you've seen here that if you are considering your lateral protrusion and medial protrusion, these are color coded and they have slopes. These are going to be your yellow and you have them in orange. So you have your slope line indicating your yellow and naturally the same thing as well. Now coming to the slightly minor ones, your very small movement of immediate side shift is a tiny little red over there that you can notice and that is going to be here also like a very very tiny shift a very very tiny little movement there and you have it again here and when you talk about the ability to move your mandible back this is also a very small movement a very small movement with a very small red line as well so here again you have it as your very tiny small little movement visible on the screen during your retrusion fine so you have that as well. now if you look at all these things put together with your occlusal compass you will be able to take a look as to how it actually varies at the condylar level on the working side varies on the non-working side for example if you take a look at the condyle here the condyle on the screen's left is indicating that it is undergoing working movement so it's marked straight outwards with blue now, both condyles cannot undergo working movement at the same time. So, while the condyle is moving outwards doing the working side on the screen's left, you will notice that the maxillary cusp is also moving in the same direction as far as the line is concerned because the lower functional cusp is marking it off in the same direction. But the effect of the maxillary cusp on the mandible is in the opposite direction. So, you'll notice that your line of the lateral protrusion or functional movement is towards the right side of the screen here. Now, take a look at the non working condyle. There is no working contact indicated there. You're only having the non working or balancing contact, which is your medial protrusion given in green. Similarly, if you're moving outwards, there is a certain component of outward and forward. So lateral protrusion along with lateral protrusion can take place on the working condyle towards the left, the condyle towards the top. If you take a look at the right condyle, you will notice that you have your medial protrusion along with your medial protrusion. So it's interesting to note how you can divide these functional movements as per the area. Which area are you talking about? The functioning side, the non-working side, is it the tooth that you're talking about or the condyle letter you're talking about? So the same thing as to how they influence the anteriors as we've seen before, that there's more of an influence of the medial protrusion the lateral protrusion and the protrusion towards the anterior teeth, you don't have much of an impact of the working side and the non-working side towards the front. Not much. There is, but not much. Now, when this is put together, as this is put together as a whole picture, if you're using your color coordinate waxes to do your complete wax up, this is how it would appear. This is how it would appear. You would be having the color coordinated array of each particular cusp indicating a particular type of influence made by the antagonistic cusp. So we've seen once again that you have your various contacts. One was laid down by Payne and Lundin and one was by P.K. Thomas. Now your curiosity should be, is there anything that as it is now, I'm trying to convince you not to look at a tooth as a tooth, but look at them as individual cusps. And then I'm trying to tell you that on each particular cusp, maybe there's a particular area that the contacts are actually happening. So are there any specific areas? So this is, this is how you would label the various areas on the teeth as the areas where the contacts are to occur. So you will have to be able to memorize what each cusp looks like, where each cusp is located, and what is the normal function attributed to that particular cusp of that particular tooth as influenced by the antagonistic contact? And are there any areas of significance? So now it's getting, the, uh, the discussion is getting heavier. Now, what if I could divide a tooth into segments? 
so uh, there is a, a master technician called relu blidia who uh, was kind enough to share his cad design uh, of the molar split up into segments so i got a 3d printed so i could show it to you so imagine you could split up your tooth so it's no longer a molar we, we are no longer talking about individual teeth we are talking about the individual cusps so each particular cusp yes we have names we know that we call them mesio buccal distro buccal and so on and so forth but when we take a look at these individual cusps fixed on in sequence like this one after the other after the other to make up a tooth is there something we should know about each individual cusp so is there anything of significance yes when you look at it from an evolution perspective from a developmental point of view not many textbooks have enlightened us as to this point during our uh, days of studies but every single cusp has got a specific name for example read off the names for you here you would refer to them no longer as your mesio buccal as your distro buccal as your mesio lingual or whatever you would learn to refer to them as your endoconoid your metaconoid your protoconoid your hypoconoid and your hypoconoloid so these are the names given to those segments and these are of evolutionary significance if you look at slightly lower life forms as the evolution has come towards man there are these variations on how the teeth shapes have evolved into today's shape and some of these particular names exist in the other previous forms as well so the same thing is there for the maxilla as well that you have your division into segments and each one has been given a name so now i need to take you on to another master technician see you have to understand that this is almost a craze in germany europe very strongly follows and believes in the occlusal compass it is one of the uh, the, the the programs the uh, training schedules which is always all sold out and usually pretty expensive pretty expensive because this is a very dense topic very difficult to understand so each person has made a contribution now we are talking about another master technician called roland shall who has put things together he has taken the occlusal compasses color coding and he has taken the various evolutionary names and tried making two rotating discs in a small card which you could use like a ready reckoner to see what each part is supposed to have as its significance so this is how it is normally available and he has been kind enough to let us have the segments to show you people as to what each significance is so you are trying to understand now that if you are talking about a particular functional cusp where exactly is the target of the contact of this tooth on its opposing surface so for that you know the compass we have our various movements your protrusion your medial protrusion your lateral protrusion your lateral protrusion and so on and so forth but now we are dividing them as per the sides and the various cuspal names so you have it here divided you have the split up cuspal morphology here divided and then we get into the individual details so what is the first segment called the first segment for example here is your protocone your protocone is your first segment which is in green so this is the segment which is attributed towards your medial protrusion next your second segment is your lateral protrusion segment which is your metacone metacone is your second segment so you would naturally think sir this is the distro buccal cusp yes but then we we'll refer to it here henceforth as the metacone we are not using our family name we are trying to get used to the fact that it is blue and it is your metacone now the next third segment would be what is called your paracone which would allow your lateral protrusion the, the cusp in yellow which you would refer to normally as your mesio buccal cusp it allows the sliding of the opposing surface so this would be your paracone you would notice that there are multiple component areas of the paracone but we won't go into that as of now now the next segments would be for example the tiny hypocone and your uh, other segment which is like going to uh, give you your protrusion movements so these are basically going to give you the effect of your protrusion of your opposing cusp fine so you have the tiny little segment along with the hypocone here which are responsible for the protrusion now we going on to the mandibular division of the segments as you can see in the split up over here again we look at the first segment it is called the hypoconoid which is basically a green referring to your medial protrusion movement and it is the midpoint as you can see on the lower molar surface and then you going to your second uh, segment which is going to be your blue which allows the lateral protrusion so you can see it on the lingual aspect of the molar so you can see the blue segment there the metaconoid and the third segment which is called your 
Entoconoid is going to be the yellow segment, again visible on the lingual surface of the mandible. And then the segments responsible for the protrusion, you have your smaller segment and larger segment as we had with the maxillary molar. Here you have names, your hypoconoid and your protoconoid. These would be your segments responsible for your protrusive movements. So you can see here that if you again try ascribing, for example, if we try thinking, okay, now tell us how many contacts would be there for a molar. There would be nine contacts for a molar. So your first contact of the molar is visible on the screen here that you have your contact of your mesia proximal marginal fascia on the mesia buccal cusp. Now you're having similarly your distal proximal marginal fascia on the mesia buccal cusp in your second type of contact. Here you have your mesia buccal cusp going on to your distal buccal cusp, then so on and so forth. You have a description of how the distal buccal cusp goes on to the distal buccal cusp and the mesial palatal cusp onto the mesial lingual cusp your mesial cusp onto the distal lingual cusp, distal palatal cusp onto the mesial approximate marginal fascia, your distal palatal cusp and the mesial enamel ridge onto the opposing surface and the last contact. So don't get too worried about these. It's just that, okay, so there are nine areas where specifically you would want to check during a wax up. During a wax up, you'd want to check these areas. So these would be the various areas that we were talking about as far as the molars are concerned. So luckily for us, there are not many teeth to worry about. You have two molars to worry about and two premolars to worry about. So you've got four new headaches today if you're talking about the occlusal pompous theory. So this is how it would normally be. Now, if you're talking about doing it, suppose now if we were to sit together and we would want to do it, you could take one of your conservative models, nice large size one, chop off the surface, and mark off your acquisal compass first on it. Because now we know how we're supposed to mark off the compass. Mark off a rough, rough outline, rough, rough outline as to where you want the midpoints of your cusps to be. Start off, for example, with your lateral protrusion cusp being built up in yellow. Build it up within the confines of the shape that you would expect from morphology. You are giving a trilobe structure. So give it accordingly. Don't just make it a pyramidal type of a shape. Give it the trilobe structure. And then we go on to the lateral protrusion in your blue, building it up, followed by the protrusive aspect, followed by the meat protrusion aspect, and the last protrusive aspect there. So this would complete a wax up in a trilobe manner along the guidelines of the occlusal compass, understanding the influence of the opposing cusps. Now, every year at Germany, you have what is called the International Conference uh, Competition for the Occlusal Compass. So this was uh, during the 10th international competition, one of the best documentations by Doreen George and Anila Kolos. So these people have, if you can look at uh, the uh, Yeti wax uh, array above, this is how you normally would get uh, color coordinated waxes, both from Yeti available locally from uh, Vijay Dental Depot. You also have Renford's local marketing team uh, selling what are called NAT waxes. So these are what can be used in a color coordinated sequence. To learn these things, you get even simple colored waxes on Amazon, which can be used for the same purpose. I have used uh, crayons for uh, practice at times. You can also just simply learn this off using plasticine, modeling clay. We'll talk about that a little later. So giving you an example as to how the waxing up is being done here, your black for protrusion as visible on these central incisors, your yellow for your lateral protrusion as visible on the laterals. And by the time you come to the working uh, side movements, it is obviously seen on a canine guidance. So you have the slight tinges of blue on the canines and the color coordinate sequence for the posterior teeth. Now, this would be what is used to fabricate the actual crowns. Now you would ask me, in what way is this significant? It is significant if you are okay with going ahead with pressable ceramics. So everything that you have made in wax can be replicated in a pressable ceramic. So you're giving a highly customized occlusal morphology to your patient. And this is what some of the premium labs and premium technicians offer in Germany. This is what is done by default. So again, what we've seen here is the color coordination. Uh, I was telling Dr. Matthew that I would offer a special goodie to the participants today. And here goes on the 17th of October, which happens to be a Sunday, we will have a small teeny weeny training module, a hands-on training module on Zoom. Uh, and that would be the essentially the morning session. So you could send in anyone who would want to break their heads further on this particular occlusal pompous concept is most welcome to join in. 
no charge at all, free of charge. Let us learn and let us share information. So toss me a mail at doubts at ymail. It's like asking me why. It's not Gmail, doubts at ymail.com. So we can then have a small hands-on session regarding this on the 17th. Now you may ask me, uh, why can't we have it the day after tomorrow on Sunday? Now, the reason why I pushed it a little further down the line is so that I could share some of the reading information and technical details with participants who would want to learn further. So that when you're working on, for example, a single tooth, like a, a maxillary molar or a mandibular molar, you have a better idea as to what is expected from you. Right? So thank you one and all for your patience. This is Dr. Prakash from Anil Nirakon Institute of Dental Sciences signing out. And I thank the organizers for this wonderful session today. So I will stop with my screen share and over to the organizers. I am open for doubts if you'd like to ask me anything. Thank you so much, Dr. Prakash, for making this extensive talk on uh, occlusion, breaking it into different colors, different parts, no? going into the histology of it, <laughs> I should say. And uh, I think initially we even thought that we could have a small hands-on uh, training for the PGs, uh, but uh, because of time constraints, maybe we can't do that. So we would have it later as a session. So whoever is interested uh, could uh, please go on and yes. carry on with it. And uh, we are open to any questions that are there uh, regarding this uh, talk. Anyone on the uh, Zoom platform could uh, unmute and go ahead with the questions. And uh, in case you have it on the YouTube, you could put it on the chat box. Uh, the sign of a mind-boggling occlusal talk is in not having instant queries because it leaves you completely high and dry. So I can completely understand that this is something which completely flies over our heads when first discussed. So what I would encourage people to do is please don't hesitate. You can uh, give us anything that you want as a query. Uh, we'll uh, give, share the recorded uh, video with you and uh, we will uh, try to make things a little bit more clearer by way of a hands-on session, as I told you, on the 17th, so you can understand things far clearer. And practice makes perfect. The more that you start moving on it, you start memorizing those colors and the significance. So don't worry too much about it. I'm here to help you out with it. And Dr. Matthew will be coordinating with you all so that we can, uh, we can work it out. So I guess we can move on to our next speaker because people are uh, quite uh, comfortable with uh, what they have seen. Right. I think, as you said, maybe it takes a little time for you to uh, comprehend. Go about. That's the same thing I do in class also. Maybe ask the students even to do, do the protrusive movement or do the uh, lateral movements and then get used to that and then yes. think about it. And maybe it takes some time for you to understand. So uh, I think you could always go with that and take your time and then uh, yes. get your questions. So, uh, Dr. Prakash, we would just. Uh, want to give you a small certificate of appreciation uh, and we would uh, send uh, send it through mail also. Thank you so uh, much. Yes. So just hold on. Yeah. So that is there for you. Thank you so much. Yes. So we will send it through mail also. Thank you so much. So I think maybe now we would uh, just take a small break and uh, anyway, I cannot host you for uh, Chai Pe Charcha now, <laughs> right? So we'll take a small break for 10 minutes and uh, I think we'll get back now. The time is around, uh, yeah, maybe around 10.35 uh, or so. I think we'll get back. Thank you.
good morning everyone once again i think we can start with the uh, second session uh, am i audible uh, shanmu priya yes sir audible sir okay so i think we'll go on with the second uh, speaker uh, dr vinod krishnan is going to speak on uh, uh, implants and uh, i would invite uh, dr shanmu priya to introduce the speaker shanmu thank priya. you sir okay yeah. Good morning, one and all. I am privileged to have the opportunity to introduce our second speaker of the day, Dr. Vinod Krishnan, MBS, working currently as professor and PG guide, Department of Prosthodontics, Amrita School of Dentistry, Kochi. He has completed BBS from Mahatma Gandhi Dental College, Pondicherry, and has pursued his master degree from Meenakshi Amma Dental College, Chennai. He is a faculty of Indian Dental Education Academy since 2003. He is also a mentor for Noble Biocare. He is the past president of Indian Prosthodontic Society, Kerala branch. He has been the organizing secretary for the 37th IPS conference and the 22nd IPS PG convention. And under his guidance, nearly 1,000 dentists have been trained in implantology. He has also conducted 12 CD programs on crown and bridge failures. His accolades include several national and international publications. and presentations a warm welcome sir thank you thank you uh, matthew shall i uh, share the screen yes please yeah it's visible yeah oh. Oh. fine yes do i have your permission sure you can go ahead thank you ma'am well uh, so at the outset let me congratulate uh, the management of uh, ksr indian um, institute of dental science and research um the principal dr sharath ashok and my good old friend my best buddy dr ashok matthew um and uh, team prosto for having a thought of uh, recognizing the geriatric patients and um, um you know conducting this program today so when dr matthew called me and asked uh, what i would like to talk on with my interest in implants i thought uh, the best topic would be to speak about the challenges that we face when uh, geriatric patients actually come to meet us and uh, uh most often uh, we uh, come up with uh, challenges in the bone so um matthew told that he was happy to have that and uh, so that's how i prepared for this lecture um all of you know what an implant is uh, but then i i try to make it as simple as possible because we have a wide audience i believe even undergraduate uh, students are here to listen so an implant is any object or material such as uh, an alloplastic substance or other tissue which is partially or completely inserted or grafted into the bone for therapeutic diagnostic prosthetic or experimental purpose all of us know that the most common uh, material that is used for uh, uh, making implants is commercially pure titanium zirconia is also used but uh, most prevalently we have uh, commercially pure titanium you should understand that um, um, uh, implants over the period of last 5 uh, to 6 decades have evolved in a design the macro design and the micro design and today most of the implant designs are root form implants and uh, with uh, the uh, economic condition in our country improving more and more people are prepared to invest in improving their quality of life uh, which means that implant is becoming very popular not only really among uh, the special specialty practitioners but also among uh, the general practitioners and it holds a great potential for providing some fantastic solution for the general public it has revolutionized the way uh, prosthetic solutions have been Uh, provided for uh, the general public um loose dentures uh, can be a part of history 
uh, if it goes the way it is over the next couple of decades. So these are the different types of implant designs which have happened uh, over uh, decades. And uh, today, we most of us are going for root form implants. I'm not going to spend much time talking about the history. But then when we speak about implants, the first and foremost thing that I would like to talk is that it is a prosthetically driven discipline. Patients do not come for implants, they come for teeth. And implant is a mode of providing solution for replacement of missing teeth. So essentially, if you do not have a prosthetic aptitude, you're not going to be a successful implantologist. What is the foundation for implant? Bone is the foundation for implant. So it is very important that we have a very good idea about bone, the challenges posed by bone, and how we are going to manage those challenges. Following extraction, what happens? You have a qualitative and quantitative reduction in bone tissue. You have depletion of density and volume of bone. If you see the color combination, quality and density have the same color, which means that what we are trying to imply is that when we speak about quality of bone, it is the density of bone that we are talking about. When we speak about quantity of bone, we are speaking about the volume. You can have good volume of bone with poor density. You could have a huge bone, bony structure, which doesn't have dense bony tissue inside at all, or vice versa. You could have thin bone, which is very dense. We need to know how to evaluate this bone, how to assess this bone. Only if we know how to assess this bone, will we have an idea as to how to manage it. So first and foremost, I'll just brief on what are the parameters on the basis of which we assess bone for it to receive dental implants. The available bone is measured in terms of width, height, length, angulation, and crown height implant body. So on the left side, you see, you measure the height of the available bone from the crest of the alveolar ridge to the nearest anatomical limitation. In this case, here it is the inferior alveolar nerve. The width is the buccolingual width, which measures the thickness of your bone. Length is the mesiodistal length, which is the length between the adjoining teeth or adjoining implants. We'll go through this again. Then you have the angulation. Ideally, Implants have to be placed perpendicular to the occlusal plane, but that is not usually possible owing to the anatomy of bone. Then, when you think in, you know, about implant, it is implant, uh, very important that you think about the available prosthetic space or the crown height. I have come across numerous cases where implants have been placed and at this stage of impression making, or when the cast is made, the technician calls up and tells that there is no space for a crown. So diagnosis and treatment planning is very important. While we are speaking about bone today, it is extremely important that you assess the prosthetic space, the crown height. The minimum crown height for a cemented restoration would be eight millimeters from the crust of the bone which would include a height for the abutment for a, of at least five millimeters so that it provides retention. Yeah. And then some space for attachment of the soft tissue beneath in the, in the abutment and on top sufficient occlusal clearance. Sorry. Yeah, coming to available bone height. Here you see in the picture that the bone height is defined by the anatomic limitations that are present in the maxilla and mandible. This governs the selection of the length of the implant fixture. The length of the implant is decided by the available bone height. Okay, And this has got its implication in the force that is generated and the aesthetics. In the anterior region, maxillary anterior region, it is the nasal cavity and maxillary posterior region, it is the maxillary sinus, which limits or defines the length of the implant. Mandibular anterior region, we do not have 
anatomic limitations usually and in the posterior region you have the inferior alveolar lobe and the mental foramen which defines the length of the implant when it comes to the available bone width i told you earlier it is the buccolingual width this along with the mesiodistal length decides the diameter of the implant the buccolingual width is the available bone between the facial and lingual plates at the crest of the potential implant site you need to have at least 0.5 mm of bone around the implant so if you have a 5 mm buccolingual width you can think in terms of about 4 mm diameter bone coming to the available bone length the mesiodistal length of the available bone that is limited by adjacent teeth or implants the minimum uh, space uh, that is uh, between implant and tooth is about 1.5 mm whereas between two implants it is about 3 mm why the space it is so because bone loss that occurs at the crestal module if you have a vertical defect if two implants are too close to one another then it will be converted to a horizontal defect which means that you will have all the bone that is there between the implants lost so it is important that you have minimum 3 mm space between two implants you don't require that kind of space between natural tooth and implants because that is a heavily because of the periodontal ligament you have a lot of blood supply and the bone can be sustained there another factor for this mesiodistal length is this i mentioned allows for the crown contouring or provision of emergence profile so mesiodistal length along with the buccolingual width defines the diameter of the implant available bone angulation ideally bone is prepared to ideally in ideal scenarios you would like to have um the forces that are transmitted to the implant perpendicular to it so that all the forces that come on to the implant are compressive forces implants are better equipped to tolerate compressive loads than tensile or shear loads but it is not always possible for you to place implant per perfectly perpendicular to the plane of occlusion owing to the anatomy of bone in the anterior region maxillary central incisor region you can load the implant at only 12 uh, degrees so the angulation of the implant is essentially determined by the anatomy of bone what you need to understand is the implication of this is more and more angulated the implant is it will have to sustain more and more load which means that say if an implant is placed perpendicular to the plane of occlusion and you give 100 newton load 100 newton load will be transmitted as compressive load onto the bone but if you were to place the implant at an angulation say about 20 degree angulation you have angulated abutment it is true you will be able to give an aesthetic solution it is true but then the load that is happening on this crown will be a force magnifier because of the angulated abutment so if 100 newton load is coming onto this crown the essential load that is transmitted onto the bone would be say around 120 newton of which 80 newtons would be about the compressive load 30 newtons would be tensile load and 10 newtons of shear stress will come so as the angulation of the implant increases you will have more and more of tensile and shear component increasing which can be a challenge to the implant life of the implant the last one as i told earlier this is not given a due um, significance quite often during diagnosis and treatment planning it is the available crown height implant body ratio the prosthetic height is another terminology that is popularly used as the height of the crown increases it has got its implications in aesthetics okay the restoration might not look very aesthetic apart from that you will have a tremendous cantilever load on the implant the vertical cantilever which will result in crestal bone loss okay 
So what are the consequences of bone loss, the challenges posed? Most of the undergraduate students and uh, people from other discipline would actually uh, recognize the changes that are seen uh, once teeth are removed because they have they have actually worked with uh, removable partial dentures and complete dentures. And these challenges uh, pose greater challenges quite often in cases of implant dentistry. So what happens once teeth are lost? Let us just familiarize with what are uh, the general conditions that we see. Once teeth are lost, the alveolar process starts resorbing. It is a irreversible progressive order. Unless you place an implant and it is going to arrest the progress of this resorption, the alveolar process is going to keep resorbing. Alveolar process is essentially evolved for supporting teeth. Once teeth are lost, then it keeps resorbing. It will resorbe to the uh, completely, it will reach the basal bone and even the basal bone can resorb. Okay. You see in the picture below, the myelohyoid ridge here, it has become very prominent because of resorption. Other things that you could come across is loss of the keratinized tissue. What is the significance of keratinized tissue? You would like to have keratinized tissue around the dental implant for good soft tissue health. Okay. See on the picture on the right side, you have very prominent genial cubicle. This is a, a division D bone about which we'll be talking later. You can have pencil mandibles, which are very thin. There are in, in instances where implants have been placed in very thin mandible and fracture of the mandible has happened. Okay, so you need to be very careful as you choose your case. You could have muscle attachments which can uh, prove detrimental to the health of the implant. Yeah, thinning down of mucosa is another uh, challenge that uh, we face in implant uh, scenarios. Vertical alveolar bone loss is another challenge. Now, see, you can place implants here. You can give a prosthesis. But you see, the uh, implant prosthetic junction will be way up near the sulcus, where generally the patient's brush will not reach. So while you have given an aesthetic restoration, maintenance is going to be a very big challenge. The picture on the upper right side is that of a patient who came yesterday. He's only 27 years old and you have, um, uh, you know, uh, periodontal uh, issues in his mouth and he's getting married in about three months time and he wants implant solution. Now, it is quite a challenge to give such a solution, which is going to be sustained for a longer period of time. You are not going to planning to give a prosthetic solution, you know, two years down the lane patient comes back with you know implant being loose or the process is not serving the purpose the middle picture on, uh, uh, is one uh, where uh, the lady has come with a severe bone loss in the uh, second quadrant of the maxilla i think i'll be speaking about this case how uh, we have gone ahead doing uh, bone augmentation in this case so such cases you see while Bone resorption is one challenge. We need to augment bone and manage bone to receive implant. The other challenge is the increase in prosthetic space, which is again a force magnifier. Loss of basal bone. This is a fantastic pictographic representation for you people to realize. Once teeth are lost, you will have the alveolar process loss and then you will reach the basal bone. What is the patient coming for? Patient is coming for replacement of teeth. Where will you place the teeth? The teeth will be placed where the teeth were present before they were lost. You cannot change the position of the teeth in a big way. Okay. It has to serve for aesthetics and phonetics. So if you were to place implants on this basal bone, and if you're going to place a fixed restoration, just imagine the height of the fixed restoration. It is longer than the total length of the natural teeth which means that it is longer than the crown and root of the lower anterior teeth. And it will be a very, um, it, um, you know, tremendous cantilever load will be there in such case. So you will have to think about alternate solutions, implant-based solutions, which may not be fixed. Okay. In such cases, you will have, you could have nerve impairment, you may not be able to place implants posteriorly, or you may have to uh, reposition the nerve as you place the implants. Yeah, The prosthetic space and the crown height space, as I said earlier, is increased. 
Another challenge that we face is that you will have resorption of the maxilla and the, uh, you know, uh, inwards. The maxilla will shrink in size with the buccal cortical plate uh, shrinking and the mandible will actually enlarge in size and the mandible will be placed in the outer aspect. Man maxilla will be placed within the mandible. But then again, you cannot change the position of the teeth. Teeth have to be there where they were because you're trying to satisfy aesthetics and Phonetics. You will have a more active tongue. Tongue would have been playing the role of breaking down food, so it will become hypertrophic, and this will, uh, um, you know, bring in a lot of challenges. The floor of the mouth will come uh, in level with the crest of the alveolar ridge. Extra oral features, I'm sure most of you will actually uh, relate to uh, the pictures that I'm going to see. Most of the picture patients will come with extensive resorptions, come up with these problems. You have a decreased facial height. You have an increased columella filtrum angle. You have thinning of the vermilion border of the lips from loss of muscle tone. You have, you know, ptosis of buccinator and mentalis muscle, drooping of the muscles, which results in which chin and deepening of nasal groove. Here, why do I have this picture? Well, this is a consequence of bone loss. I want you people to think that when you're thinking in terms of prosthetic restoration, implant retained or implant supported restoration, you should have multiple solutions in hand to benefit these patients. While replacement of teeth is one aspect, aesthetic uh, solution is another aspect. Here, the lips have to be supported. Yeah, you need to bring down the columella filtrum angle for them to uh, look uh, good, look natural. So you may have to think in terms of denture flanges, dentures, removable solutions, which are retained or supported by the implants. All solutions in implant dentistry is not metal ceramic crowns. So you should think in terms of other solutions. What are the other issues that we see? Loss of labiomental angle, loss of lip support, deepening of vertical lines in lip and face, decreasing of horizontal labial angle of lip, which makes the patient look unhappy, loss of tone in muscles and facial expression. These things, the prosthesis should be able to provide a solution with by supporting the tissue around. Now, having seen the consequences of bone loss, we need to see as to how do we classify bone so that we prepare ourselves to give appropriate solution for these cases. Classification uh, will be based on quantity and quality. So when I spoke about bone in the beginning itself, I spoke about these two parameters, which essentially reflect the volume and density of bone. So as Dr. Sharath um, started off speaking about his uh, being taken to task for uh, speaking about the Atwoods classification, this would be a fantastic classification for us to start off. So um, you know, all of us know the class one case would be where natural tooth is a bearing uh, in the alveolus. Then class two is immediately post extraction. The socket is still intact. Class three would be a high alveolar process. The socket has healed. Yeah. Class four would be high narrow alveolar process. So it is high. It is narrow. Class five would be rounded flat alveolar process. So it is wide, but it is short. Class six is concave flat alveolar process, which means that it is very short. So, but then this uh, particular classification is generally not used in implants. The reason why I put here is this is something which all of us can relate to. Then comes the Mishjodi classification, which is very popular. And division A is abundant bone. You have enough and more bone to play with, and your implants, you can place the most a sta a standard and ideal implant to give a long term success. Division B adequate bone, I call it barely sufficient bone. Division C is compromised bone. Division D is deficient bone. So A, B, C, D, A for abundant, B for barely sufficient, C for compromised, and D for deficient bone. Well, the focus here is on compromised bone and deficient bone. So down below, you see the parameters uh, that we use to assess bone. In division C bone, the height is less than 12 millimeters. The width is less than 2.5 millimeters. 
and you have a severe angulation which is more than 13 degree and have a huge ground height space. So while the anatomy, the volume and the density of the bone might not be very favorable, the prosthetic height is also increased. So you have factors which are going to be force magnifiers. It is going to increase the challenge onto the implant system. Division D is basal bone, wherein you do not have any alveolar process. You have a flat maxilla, almost contiguous with the palate. Mandible, you have pensable mandible. You will have to be very careful as you deal with. And the crown height space is 20 millimeters, which is almost 2 centimeters in each arch and telling. It is not both the arch together. So you have a huge prosthetic space. The prosthesis is huge and the implants will be fever. The implants will be shorter. So you need to look at methods to reduce the load on the implants. The Coleman's are classification. Again, they uh, reflect the same. You see the picture on the right side. And so as the bone uh, resolves from A to E, you see the volume decrease above. And down below, you see the classification based on the density of bone. So you could classify it as D1, D2, D3, and D4. D1 is uh, dense bone where you have a um, a good proportion of cortical bone with a very minimal proportion of cancellous bone. This is generally found in the lower anterior region. And here the challenge is that while you will get very good uh, primary stability of the implant when you place the implant, the blood flow, the blood perfusion is very less because of lack of cortical bone. As you do your osteotomy, it will generate a lot of heat. So you will have to be very careful. You will have to go ahead with sharp drills, pumping action, enough and more of irrigation. You may have to use a bone tap, a bone tap to tap the bone so that the implant goes in without much resistance. Second one is the best combination that we could ask for, wherein you have sufficient cortical bone for primary stability and good amount of cancellous bone for blood supply, which will help in healing. Division three and division four are generally seen in the maxillary posterior region. You will have to be very careful. Density is very less. So you will have to start managing the bone from the osteotomy protocol itself, wherein you may have to under-prepare the bone as you place the implants. And you may have to load the implants slowly, okay? Now that we have a fair idea about the parameters on the basis of which we are going to assess implant and on the classification with which we are going to uh, define uh, the uh, bone, we need to have an idea about the classification of partially and completely edentulous arches in the implant dentistry. This gives us an idea about the challenges that we could have. Classification of the partially edentulous spaces is a continuation of uh, the um, very nicely adapted the um, Kennedy's classification itself. Here in this picture, you see, we are speaking about Kennedy class one, which is bilateral distal extension cases, wherein you do not have teeth uh, posteriorly. Whatever teeth are present, they are present only in the anterior region. Class one division A. So when I say division A, it is abundant bone, enough and more bone. When what is enough and more bone, you have more than 12 millimeters of bone height from the, here, the inferior alveolar nerve upwards, here from the sinus downwards. The buccolingual width is five millimeters. So you can place a four millimeter diameter implant, which is the standard diameter. And you could go ahead with a 10 millimeter long implant. Here the mesiodistal length is six millimeters or more, okay? Division B bone, when you come, yeah, what happens? The buccolingual width is between 2.5 and six mm. The width, reduces. So if you want good width, you may have to reduce the height of the bone, which results in a longer, taller prosthesis, which can again increase the cantilever load. So essentially, you see, while you're following Kennedy classification, you're adding the quantity of bone also. Division C bone, here you have very little bone. That is why it is called compromised bone. You're seeing that it is very close to the inferior alveolar nerve on top, uh, the uh, very little space between the crust and the sinus floor. Division D, it is even worse. The nerve is almost on the crest. Okay. So as a 
age progresses as a consequences of uh, as consequence of tooth loss over a period of time the alveolar process is lost and this poses a big challenge for us to give implant based prosthetic solution you may have to go ahead with nerve repositioning you may have to go ahead with sinus lift you know go about doing bone augmentation and then go about placing implants and going further now similarly we could go ahead with kennedy class 2 classification which is a unilateral condition wherein teeth are not there only in one side posterior of the arch so here again you could go ahead with the division a and as i have shown you in the second picture division c so it is class 2 division c when we say class 2 it is kennedy class 2 here you have class 3 division b and class 3 division c you can have all these scenarios patient might have all the other teeth present yeah quite commonly we see in the lower anterior region many a times patient comes with periodontal problem in the lower anterior region they lose the lower anterior teeth and you will lose a good amount of bone so if you were to place implants in the lower anterior segment with all the other natural teeth in good health condition the height of the prosthesis in the lower anterior region will be nearly 2 cm and the maintenance becomes the biggest problem for such patients so you need to think about solutions which will be able to sustain the health of implant you need not always think in terms of a fixed solution i'll show you some solutions that we give to the patients here with compromised bone this is class 4 again uh anterior teeth are missing which uh, edentulous space which crosses the midline you could have division a second picture is division c minus h minus h mane the height is compromised in a big way you would have compromised bone which is compromised in width also completely edentulous of course here kennedy has not played a role mish has come up with a classification he has uh, classified the bone into three regions you have the anterior portion the right posterior portion and the left posterior portion so he has created a formula for communication of the condition of the patient say for example here type 1 would be wherein you have uniform bone loss in the maxilla and in the mandibular region everywhere it is division a everywhere it is division c or division b or division d so you could simply communicate that this is the scenario so when you speak to your surgeon or your friend or your prosthodontist that it is a division c case then the solutions which can be used for division c case comes to your mind here you have a type 2 wherein you have a combination of two different types of bone volume in different areas in the patient's mouth so here it is division ab as the name suggests you have a in the anterior portion and b on either side or you could have division bc so it is b in the anterior region and compromised bone in the posterior region bilateral so that is type 2 naturally type 3 would be wherein you have different types of bone resorption in different region anteriorly it is a a right posterior it is b left posterior it is d so you see the formula here first what is written is the anterior region second is the right posterior and third is the left posterior region so this can be used for communication beyond communication i wish you people realize that they are all challenges that we have as prosthodontists when we try to restore these areas with implant supported prosthesis it doesn't end there we prosthodontists have uh, challenges of maxillofacial defects with which patients come they um, um, commonly we come across these uh, scenarios when they have some tumor you know in the mandible in the maxilla mucormycosis of late many such cases have come up and uh, you know uh, trauma those are the cases where we'll have to manage rehabilitating these uh, challenges we do a lot of uh, uh, this work here we have a fantastic head and neck team my colleague dr manju is um, Um, uh, um you know into rehabilitative works in this in a very big way so uh, we come to see and manage a lot of uh, cases i'll be speaking about them a little so coming to implant implant prosthetics options for uh, partial and complete edentulous arches broadly the prosthetic solutions can be classified into five types okay two 
subtypes. One is fixed processes and the other is removable processes. Fixed processes will be uh, called FP and they are classified into three types. Removable processes are classified into two types. Fixed processes FP1, it essentially replaces only the crown and that appears like the tooth. So FP1 is generally found in division A bone or immediately post extraction, you place the implant and then you go ahead. Those are scenarios where you find FP1. So the prosthesis replaces only the anatomic crown. FP2 is when some amount of resorption has happened. You're looking at say uh, division B or division C type of bone, wherein, you know, the prosthetic crown replaces the anatomic crown and the portion of the root. FP3 is where the prosthesis replaces a portion of the gingiva. Coming to removable prosthesis, they are of two types. Okay. Essentially, they are classified on the basis of what they gain from the implant. The removable prosthesis RP4 type gains support and retention from the implant. RP5 gains only retention from the implant okay so but both of them are removable so essentially just for revision we could classify the system into two types implant supported and implant retained so you have all the fixed processes which are supported by implants of course retained also removable processes rp4 is supported by implant whereas rp5 is only retained by implant you have only a retention component when you have extensive resorptions and collateral changes that happen in the face which we have described earlier you will require a removable denture which is going to support the face the lips the cheek yeah and occupy the existing prosthetic space which is huge so that is where we go ahead with RP5. So what are the advantages of RP uh, removable processes over fixed processes? One is that you have fever implants. You need not think in terms of bone grafting. Yeah, you can place implants, you know, you, you it's okay if you place two, three millimeters distally or buccally, it doesn't have a big implication in your processes. You have improved aesthetics because uh, it's supposed to lips and cheek denture teeth, any failure you can easily manage. You have a labial flange to support the cheek again. Yeah. So, and fever implants easily maintained. Denture is removed at night. Patient can keep the area clean. The implants are clean. When they come for recall visit, it is easy for us to actually, you know, uh, manage, uh, do the hygiene stuff. So that way, removable processes is better. And is more cost effective than the fixed solutions. Complications with fixed solutions are more demanding and more challenging. Now, this is a classification of overdenture. I won't take much time, but the number of particularly in the mandibular region, overdentures can be classified based on the number of implants that they have placed and the position of the implants. So OD1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So uh, OD1, you see uh, you have only two implants and you have ball abutments which retain the uh, prosthetic denture. And this will be the least uh, retentive among all the solution because you have only two implants and you have ball abutments. Second one, OD2, is wherein you have a bar connecting these two implants, and then the retention of this denture is going to be much better. You see on the right side, there is a terminology PM6, PM3 to 6, PM is prosthetic mobility. Okay, so prosthetic mobility is less when you use a bar. When you go ahead with three implants, OD3A and OD3B, Again, the classification is based on the position of implant. You see A, B, C, D, E. There are five locations where the implants can be placed between the mental foramen. A, B, C, D, E. And based on the position of the implants, this is classified. Then coming to OD4, you have 
better retention. You may be able to use support also. So OD4 is where you have four implants placed and you have a cantilever also. This could be related to a stool with three legs. It is stable and strong. Okay. OD5 is when you have five implants, it is like a four leg chair. So the stability is fantastic. You can confidently sit. Even a heavy person can sit without the fear of falling. Now, see, those are the examples. Left side top, what you're seeing is uh, zygomatic implant, uh, you know, retained bar or which you could have a prosthesis uh, with precision attachment. The prosthesis can be small if required. Okay, if, if that will suffice uh, for supporting your lips and cheek and fullness and all, then you can make a small prosthesis which uh, with uh, the benefit of which would be, you know, gag reflex patient has got a better sense of taste. Advantage would be, it could be removed and cleaned. It could be kept aside at night. So if there's any nocturnal habit, it can be managed. RP5, you see, this is RP5 OD2, wherein you have a bar at, connecting two uh, implants and then you have a denture with sleeves on it. Now, these days, with the advent of rapid prototyping and uh, technology and uh, uh, CAD CAM, we have some fantastic bar uh, solutions which are available with all the implant systems. You have the Dolder bar, which we have always uh, learned, uh, you know, uh, early on for our overdenture and things and all. You have the round bar, you have uh, milled bars made of titanium, it could be made of chrome cobalt, you have the header bar with slips, okay. Um, then you have the Paris bar, the Montreal bar, different bar designs are available, which you could choose. And this gives some fantastic solutions. When I say fantastic, especially when you have huge prosthetic space, you can, when you can compare these bars to um, the alveolar process. These bars uh, bring up the height uh, to the alveolar process over which you place uh, the uh, precision attached dentures, which can be removed and cleaned. And the soft tissue response to such a solution is fantastic. We do, um, we, we, um, we do a lot of Paris bar. Paris bar is what is popular in our institute and uh, coming to uh, fix it solution. This picture uh, summarizes what I spoke earlier. FP1 replaces only the anatomic contour. FP2, you have the anatomic contour and little of the root form. FP3, you have the soft tissue contour also being replaced by the prosthetic crown. Yeah. Now, broadly FP, when it comes to compromised bone, uh, that is the focus today, you have two types of solution. One is wherein you will have to go ahead with grafting methodologies, and the other is going ahead with graftless techniques. Okay, I'll be speaking a little about both just to have um, you know you people familiarize with the solutions that are there. Uh, I may not be able to speak at length uh, about all of them. I have put in few cases that me and my friends have uh, done here. Uh, now, when it comes to grafting then uh, bone manipulation method, you graft the bone so that you augment the bone, uh, you increase the uh, quantity and quality of bone so that it is better equipped to receive implant. That is where you think in terms of grafting. Okay. A common thing that is done is a red splitting or, you know, you do not have the labial cortex, which is very common. You know, patient uh, falls, meets with an accident, loses the tooth. The labial cortex is generally lost. Patient has got a, a recurring infection in the anterior teeth, a failed root canal treatment, a vertical fracture tooth. The labial cortex is lost. The anterior labial cortex, particularly in the maxillary uh, bone, is one thing that you cannot depend at all. It is very thin and you may have to use uh, graft uh, more commonly than that is generally done. Okay, maxillary sinus lift, uh, you know, it could be transosseous or lateral window technique and distraction osteogenesis, which is not very commonly done, but then that is a solution that we can think in terms of. Okay. So what is a red split? When do you think in terms of red split? When the width is less than three millimeters and you, but you have adequate height of bone, length is available. You can place a 10 millimeter long implant, but then the width is very less, okay? So it is a division C minus W, width is less. Then you can think in terms of a red split, widening and 
uh, placing some graft inside, allowing it to heal, and then going ahead. The other is when, as I said earlier, the labial cortex or the buccal cortex is missing and you do grafting technique to improve upon the bone volume. Let us see a couple of cases. Now, this lady, uh, she came to me for implant placement. She's been my patient for a very long time. On and off, she comes. She's got periodontal issues. And when she came for uh, replacement of her teeth in her second quadrant, you see the available bone, it is only 2.9 millimeter wide. And now I cannot place an implant here and give her a good solution. You see the prosthetic height is also huge. I showed this picture in the beginning. You see that prosthetic space is also high. The soft tissue thickness is about three, four millimeters. And uh, so the prosthetic height from the crest of the bone is high, the bone volume is less. So they are all, as I said earlier, force magnifiers. The picture on the left side is the way she came, right side it is after we have cemented her crowns. Now see the way the flap is elevated, the bone available is less than three millimeters in most of the areas. So what I have done is I've gone ahead using a BP blade itself and using a mallet, slowly I've gone about, um, uh, you know, uh, splitting uh, the ridge. Well, as Sharad said, every point that I speak, I remember my guru, Dr. Munratnam Naidu. And sir is the one who gave us the strength uh, to actually try out and do all these things. The Bart Parker blade with which we I split the ridge, after which I've used a twist to uh, split. Now you can see clearly how the ridge is uh, split. It is still engaged um, um, in the base. And once I have split and I have expanded the ridge, I have gone about placing bone graft uh, in between uh, the ridge. And after which I have gone about using a membrane to cover this so that you do not have any soft tissue ingress into the area where we have placed bone graft. So that is the way uh, the sutures was placed. You should make sure that the graft or the membrane is not exposed. She came back after about uh, three weeks and we um, have removed the sutures. Uh, we are preparing to place implants for her by the end of uh, October. So this is another case. Uh, this is um, 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 one of our students, uh, who came, uh, she had uh, two crowns in the maxillary anterior region. She had some discomfort. I'm sorry about the quality of the picture. Um, and the, uh, there was internal resorption in the central incisor and we had to go about removing the uh, central incisor that is uh, uh, one one. Two one was already extracted and the bone volume as you see in the picture down below, it's only 1.8 millimeter wide. So she wanted two implants. I did give her the option of going ahead one in, with one implant and having a cantilever um, uh, replacing the other missing tooth. And uh, those are the crowns. The crowns were uh, removed and the flap was elevated and you see the condition of the bone, very little bone there. And we place the implant, then we place the graft to manage the labial cortical defect. Uh, she is still insisting on her second implant. I have told her that uh, after about uh, three months, when she comes after the osseointegration of her first implant, we'll take a look and decide as to what has uh, to be done. See, again, uh, membrane has been placed and sutures have been placed. So, again, all these things for me as a prosthodontist to do, I mean, uh, something that otherwise I would have needed the help of a periodontist is all because of the blessing of Dr. Naidu, he gave me the freedom to think, boldness to work and go ahead. Sinus lift enough and more is spoken of. I'm not going to spend much time on it. Lateral window technique, wherein you know you have crustal bone less than about four millimeters, you would like to go ahead with the lateral window technique. You can place the bone craft. And if you think that you will get a good primary stability, then you can do uh, place the implant along with the sinus lift. If you think you will not get primary stability, the implant will not be stable when you place because the native bone is very less, then you might as well wait for about three months once uh, the bone graft is taken up, you can think in terms of placing the implant. When you have bone more than about say four millimeter height, then you can think in terms of a transosseous sinus lift. You need not go ahead with a 
mm, lateral window technique. You could, as such, lift the sinus through the crust itself, push bone graft, lift the sinus membrane, and then place the uh, implant simultaneously. Now, over the last two decades, we have been seeing graftless solutions coming in a big way, alternate uh, some fantastic solutions. First and foremost, that comes to our mind is, of course, uh, all on four. You know, uh, all on four was uh, um, uh, uh, technique developed by Polomolo. Only four implants are used for full arch reconstruction. Um, this is indicated for patients who have compromised bone volume. Many times, uh, people think that it is just four implants, so the cost will be less. So this is a solution that can be given for all patients. No, all on four is a concept which is developed for compromised bone, wherein other ways we may have to do a lot of grafted augmentation. This is a philosophy wherein they try to avoid grafts and depend on native bone. Well, then here you have two implants which are placed in the anterior region and two in the posterior region. Posterior implants are angulated. Oh, why are the posterior implants angulated? So that you can increase, so that you can increase the distance between the anterior implant and posterior implant in the crustal portion. Increasing the anteroposterior distance, the distance between the anterior implant and posterior implant. So when you go ahead with fixed solutions on implants, the length of the cantilever or the length of the prosthesis which goes beyond posterior to the last implant is decided by the anteroposterior distance. I'll repeat for your benefit. Implants, distance measured between the anterior most and posterior most implant decides the length of the cantilever behind it. The good aspect about all on four is that if the bone is good enough, if you have got good primary stability, then you might as well go about loading the implants immediately. I'll show you one case that I did. This gentleman had a pair of complete dentures which he wouldn't use. He was very shy to smile and um, uh, he was not able to chew and his uh, health was deteriorating. His wife was concerned and they came to me. I took the OPG, as you see, you have the sinus uh, invagination uh, on bilaterally, very little or no bone uh, posteriorly. Mandibular arch also, the uh, nerve is uh, nearing the crest, that is division C bone. So I suggested we go ahead with all on four. The picture that you see here depicts the Marlowe's guide, which helps you to uh, define the angulation of uh, the implant. Here anteriorly, we placed uh, relatively parallel implants and posteriorly, we went ahead with about 30 degree inclination. And the elements that you see uh, above the crest is called multi-unit abutment. So an abutment which has got multiple units. What are the multiple unit? One unit which engages the abutment onto the implant and another unit which receives the prosthesis. On the right side, you see the work that we have done in the maxilla for the same patient. It was done on the same day. And the protrusions that you are seeing uh, are the impression copings, which are used for making impressions. I'm not uh, you know, spending much time elaborating on those things. All on for itself can be a lecture series. So that is how the implant and the process. So this is a depictive picture. It is not the picture of the same patient. I couldn't find it. So... Uh, we went about making an impression, made the cast, then did the jaw relation and the trial the second day. And the denture was inserted the third day. So he came one day evening, the third day morning, he had the prosthesis, extremely happy patient, very happy that he did it. He did um, have his challenges immediately post uh, implant placement, but then now he chose on to anything and everything. So this is these. I have heard of a lot of people who say it is uh, all on four or none on three. And I mean, you know, diagnosis and treatment planning and selection of the case is extremely important for success of implants. You need to know which case is indicated for all on four. One. Second thing, you need to know which are the cases which can be loaded immediately, even in all on four or which have to be um, um, loaded progressively. 
you know that um, essentially it decides uh, i have not found many complications with um, all on four uh, you know the number of cases that i have done it is about a case selection so what if you do not have a bone a sufficient bone in the anterior region anterior to the sinus then you have this fantastic solution of taking engaging the zygoma going ahead with zygomatic implant so you will have two implants in the anterior portion and two implants in the posterior portion initially there were a lot of challenges with zygomatic implants because uh, the crustal portion of the implant would come in the palatal region and that would create problem for the patient to speak and you know uh, uh, reduce the tongue space and very uncomfortable for the patient but then a lot of water has flown the river and you know we have uh, implants being placed more and more buckly so you have good prosthetic space and this is a fantastic all in one solution where you have limited bone in the anterior maxilla so you can place only two implants the other two implants can be placed posteriorly you are still able to give a fixed set solution for the patient okay now this has proved to be a boon for the maxillofacial prosthodontists also so wherein patients who come with maxillectomy defects uh, can um, you know uh, have a uh, soft tissue to manage the maxillary defect and have implants engage bone in the remote region to go ahead with uh, a uh, fixed uh, prosthesis this is uh, such a case where uh, maxillectomy partial maxillectomy had to be done and uh, implants uh, three zygomatic implants were placed and one implant was placed in the anterior region a bar abutment was given and uh, this was done by uh, dr manju and a technician uh, vinod binayar who is was a big blessing for us in our institute and we have been able to do a lot of uh, good work serve a lot of good patients uh, particularly geriatric patients who come to our place short implants uh, so well yeah one thing that you need to keep in mind is that uh, there is a vertical cantilever well if you uh, take care of occlusion wherein there is no lateral load then this definitely works out uh, well coming to subperiosteal implants when i used to be in my early days uh, learning about implants i was uh, very seriously interested in uh, subperiosteal implants and uh, it not being popular uh, for uh, compelling reasons uh, for the benefit of people who do not know subperiosteal implants are placed over the bone beneath the soft tissue beneath the periosteum early days you had to reflect the soft tissue make the impression of your bone give it to the lab they will do a casting in chrome cobalt send it back to you again after about 2 weeks you reflect a flap and then place this implant put on bone graft over it and suture so these um, uh, procedure and the healing phase was generally very painful for the patient and uh, it had its own failure rates and challenges uh, of making it was very difficult but then i used to think that in compromised bone this would be a fantastic solution and it will make a reentry so that is what i am going to speak about in the coming slides which is psi or patient specific implants uh, here uh, this uh, patient at the age of 14 year juvenile uh, um, osteofibroma and they had to resect the mandible they waited till the age of about 18 and uh, in india here uh, we are able to uh, make these patient specific implants here what we do is we go about doing the jaw relation trial and uh, then uh, we place opaque markers beneath the teeth and go about doing a cbct once we uh, do the uh, cbct with the opaque markers we send it to the lab along with uh, the uh, stl images of uh, the uh, cast and they uh, sit to fabricate patient specific implants the new age subperiosteal implants in titanium okay and after which uh, these uh, implants you know those those are uh, the um, implants which have been fabricated and it is uh, on the uh, model uh, the rpd model uh, which has been generated these implants are screwed onto the bone this is actually a fibula graft which has been uh, placed uh, onto uh, in the patient's mouth and then uh, we work on it we have done a um, handful of cases and we are having very good response that's what my friends are telling see 
they are screwed and retained onto the bone and you you can immediately load it once it is placed and you have the prosthesis immediately so the patient comes into the theater we place the implant and the teeth is ready uh, the um, actually the prosthesis also comes uh, along with the um, implants so that is the final uh, prosthesis in place pre and post op this the provisional prosthesis mucormycosis i thought i'll finish up with this uh, case this was a case which came about for 5 years back uh, from tamil nadu in fact and um, her maxilla had to be resected before the pre covid days huh? and after which we went ahead uh, um, uh, you know restoring that our uh, friends in uh, head and neck they placed a fibular graft in the maxillary um, arch and uh, if i am correct that was the first case of restoring the maxilla that was done here this is how we plan uh, here so every case uh, we you know each region what is the implant that we are going to place is planned that is uh, put in front of the dental chair as we are working we even uh, define the angulation with which we are going to place the implants those are the implants placed and those are the multi unit abutments which are placed and that is the smile which we could uh, give her i i hope i have been able to um check people thinking that uh, uh, compromised bone is a reality uh, patients who walk into your clinic will come with a compromised bone it will pose challenges and that there are solutions uh, you can manage compromised bone and you can still give solutions i have i have shown you many types of solutions right from fixed prosthesis to removable prosthesis uh, all these things can be used to restore uh, patients once again i would like to thank uh, dr matthew and his team uh, for giving me this opportunity to uh, deliver this lecture i thank you all for this uh, patient audience um, matthew over to you thank you so much vinu starting yeah. off with the basics yeah. and then gradually going on uh, showing even the maxillofacial components also no? the main topic was compromised uh, bone and how you place your implants in compromised bone so starting with the basics and going slowly and gradually i think uh, it's easy for anyone uh, to understand thank you for making it so simplified thank you and, thank you uh, yeah so in i would like yeah, to thank my postgraduate student particularly dr sri lakshmi who has uh, put in a lot of efforts and all my alumni many of them actually sent the pictures you know uh, they were so forthcoming when i asked for because uh, compromised bone is something that i am talking for the first time and uh, they were all um, you know so kind to have sent i would like to thank all the faculty members and the uh, technician uh, here the hedonic uh, people uh, and all my postgraduate students for it's a team work you know and that's what uh, actually pays at the end Yes. Thank you, Vinod, and uh, my regards to all of them. The Thank entire... you. Thank you. <laughs> definitely, definitely. So, in case there are any uh, questions, you could put it on chat, or you could, uh, uh, if you are on the Zoom uh, platform, you could uh, go ahead and ask. So open to questions. you know i think it's uh, very clear so you know questions. thank you yeah thank you thank you it's i so I, I while i have thanked dr naidu my um, you know um, to the audience dr matthew spoke so much about uh, that we taught him and all it's actually the other way around um, while we learned a lot about prosthodontics together about uh, being a nice man being a kind man being a professional uh, you know there's so many things that i've learned from dr matthew he's been such a fantastic friend uh, you know and you people are blessed to have him as your teacher uh, he is leading a good team i know and uh, wish you all the very best i should also remember uh, the team at idea uh, nidu sir again uh, sendil sunita saptu we have all 
grown together i right? uh, reiterate again it is team work we all have to learn a lot you need to keep an open mind um you know that will help you grow thank you thanks a lot thank you vinod for the kind words and uh, the, the one of the first invites i sent it to naidu sir oh. <laughs> and, and uh, sir sent all his wishes he uh, sent all his wishes and he said uh, that he won't be able to make it but he sent all his wishes so good. that was the good. first invite was for sir right. good. good so okay. uh, I, i don't think we have uh, any questions Uh, could we go on to the uh, next presentation before that you know the i would just want to present the certificate of uh, appreciation oh, oh. please please accept thank you thank you yeah. i accept Yes, we know this. Is it there on screen? Yeah, yeah, it's there. Thanks a lot. Beautiful. Thank you. Th thank you so much. Yeah, thank we'll you. send it uh, later through the mail. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think we'll uh, start with the uh, third presentation uh, with Dr. Sendil Nadan. Uh, it's to do about the contemporary or uh, skills that you're supposed to know as a prosthodontist, and uh, so awaiting your uh, talk, uh, Dr. Sendil. And to give the introduction, I would uh, call upon uh, Dr. Vidya Shankari, Professor, uh, to go ahead with uh, the introduction. Ma'am, you need to uh, unmute. Sir, is it yes. clear? yeah thank yes, you yes. please go ahead good noon all on behalf of uh, professor department ks dental college i welcome dr sandeep nadan to give his lecture on challenging skill sets of prosthodontics so dr sandeep nadan he did his undergraduate and post graduation in meenakshi amal dental college to his credits he carries a, a dnb diploma in national board by the ministry of health and he is also a diplomat in indian board of prosthodontics he is a former professor and uh, he is a very well known private practitioner in uh, mohaper chennai and uh, he conducts uh, he is a course faculty for uh, many comprehensive implant training program on various academies and uh, he is a consultant in implant planning for idea dr naidu sir's uh, academy too and on a personal note and uh, he's a very good friend of mine and uh, our family and uh, now i call upon dr sandeep nathan to take up this platform and to deliver this lecture i welcome you doctor thank you thank you for your kind words uh, i can see a lot of faces that are very familiar to me uh, let me first share my screen yeah was it able to see yes dr sentha yeah we are able to see you can carry on yes sir so the topic for uh, today's presentation is changing skill sets of a prosthodontist this is the first time uh, i'm talking on such a topic uh, i feel it is uh, high time that we need to tell our fellow post graduates uh, what is needed or what is that is expected out of you when you come out and you start practicing so that's the idea for this particular presentation when dr matthew first contacted me he wanted me to give a talk on implant related and other things but i said this is the topic which i would prefer to talk for the post graduate crowd i hope this is not a only a post graduate crowd or undergraduates who are willing to become a prosthodontist uh, it is nice uh, for them to listen to this so that it becomes easy for them what is expected out of them 
ஒன் ஆஃப் த காமனஸ்ட் தமிழ்ல சொன்னோம்னா பல் டாக்டர்னா ரெண்டே ரெண்டு விஷயம் தான் ஒன்னு பல் எடுக்கணும் இன்னொன்னு பல் கட்டணும் ஸோ ஓரல் சர்ஜரி அண்ட் ப்ராஸ்தடான்டிக்ஸ் அந்த ஏன்ஷியன் ஸ்பெஷலைசேஷன்ஸ் இன் டென்டிஸ்ட்ரி ஸோ வி ஆர் இன் தட் ஏன்ஷியன் ஸ்பெஷலைசேஷன் ஆர் டைம் டெஸ்டட் ஸ்பெஷலைசேஷன் ரைட் ஃப்ரம் த டே வென் த மேன் வாண்ட்ஸ் டு திங்க் அபவுட் இஸ்தட்டிக்ஸ் வென் தே லாஸ்ட் ஆன்டீரியர் டீ தே வாண்டட் டு ஹேவ் அ டீ ஈவன் இன் த இஜிப்ஷியன் சிவிலைசேஷன் எவ்ரி வேர் தெர் ஆர் அக்கரன்சஸ் தட் ப்ராஸ்தடான்டிக்ஸ் டஸ் எக்ஸிஸ்ட் ஸோ from there onwards to this department of prosthodontics and crown and bridge is what but only thing is the name can change from one place to but prosto remains the same because i always believe change is the permanent in the world and we also should embrace the change so that we will not get lost even the dinosaur is lost so even if even if it is a big animal with a lot of power it doesn't exist anymore so i am a consultant prosthodontist and a private practitioner uh, this is my practice where i practice every day um, from morning to night and i also go for consultations in and around uh, uh, one of the uh, one of my favorite place to go is coimbatore where dr vidya's uh, husband is one of the practices which i regularly visit and this is the background for me uh, for being here dr muniratnam naidu myself and dr vinod and other two teammates are the periodontist dr sunita and the orthodontist dr saptagiri this is where i usually teach and now we have uh, this is where dr Ma- matthew had come uh, along with dr malar and uh, his wife for implant training program it was way back in 2010 so it is just a token of entry into implantology implantology is ever growing so this is our new adventure a strive dental academy which i am part of um, where we teach about implantology so many of you who are becoming a budding prosthodontist can also become like a private practitioner or a consultant prosthodontist like me so if you want to be one of the private practitioner or a consultant prosthodontist certain things that we need to discuss today the area for consultation in today's scenario are or why people are calling a prosthodontist to their practice yes either they wanted to have a fpd work done from you say a crown and bridge prosthesis or a full mouth rehabilitations a implant prosthesis a complete denture prosthesis and a implant full mouth rehabilitation which dr vinod was telling you people about how do we proceed so these are all the major uh, areas where you will be called upon for consultation that's of today's scenario see the treatment protocols are ever evolving uh, it is not the same 20 years before what i was taught in my post graduation may not be holding good today so when the treatment protocols are evaluate ever uh, changing the yesterday treatment plan may not hold good today that we need to understand accept and we need to change ourselves so that some better treatment for the patient can be provided and and most importantly we will not get lost uh, we will still there be in the race i am here to discuss the skill sets as a prosthodontist what are the things that are changing from what i learned as a prosthodontist under post graduate and uh, practicing prosthodontist now that is what i wanted to discuss here let us start with the first one the fpd or the crown and bridge prosthesis most often as a prosthodontist we would be asked to prepare a crown for a post endodontic restoration when i first listened to a lecture on a european society of cosmetic dentistry that for a root canal treated teeth you don't require a crown in 2015 i was a little shocked oh crown is not there for endodontically treated teeth 
then how we are going to survive that was the question which was running in my mind lingering in my mind so crown is one of the option for forced endodontic restoration there are many conservative options long lasting options are available apart from crown so let us see that those things the crown or no crown why people are so much did against the crown in european society or even in india it is catching up very fast it is basically because of lack of a good marginal seal and there is chances that if the patient is having a high caries index there can be a new recurrent caries that can happen so all these are the major reasons why people wanted to conserve and sometimes it can fracture we need to preserve the teeth as much as we can so now let us see a situation here wherein you have a, a class 2 lesion involving the pulp patient is reported with a pain uh, usually in my uh, practice we are bound to handle the patient for pain relief only if the pain relief is done properly people will sit for implants that's that's how i see so pain relief is part and parcel of every dentist so i went ahead isolated the teeth did a root canal preparation by removing the proper caries a access preparation and then filling the root canal then a direct composite restoration on top that is all so we don't require a crown in such situation when you are able to prepare a very minimum preparation a conservative preparation with adequate thickness of soft tissue in and around so it is important that we need to have the right kind of uh, restoration that is a direct composite restoration so it was shocking for me to understand that this works fortunately for the same patient we had uh, another teeth to be um, going for a implant we had opportunity to take a cbct if you see the cbct you can understand that there is a root canal is filled very well and see the amount of area that is used for the restoration or to gain the access in such cases uh, a minimal access preparation and you are able to manage the root canal system with the minimal preparation there is no need for because we have so much amount of residual teeth there is not much of bending of the cusp a good direct bonding restoration which is nothing but a composite restoration definitely works well that means what we need to know about and this one also as a prosthodontist okay let us see this one a little more the premolar is almost like a hollow shell uh, molar is almost like a previous case let us see what can be done when we isolate and when we start preparing when we start excavating the caries it, the premolar is almost like a shell the molar will be little better but the buccal and the palatal walls are not sufficient enough to withstand so what we can do in such situation or what the restorative dentist let me come back again the term restorative dentist is common because we are going to give a comprehensive solution for that particular teeth because it is the restorative dentist who is responsible for treating entirely so in such cases what is the treatment option if i am going to give a crown in such cases especially the premolar whatever remaining tooth structure that is going to be there is going to be cut off that too if you are going for all ceramic or a metal with a ceramic crowns nothing will be left the patient will be coming back with the crown in down the lane for in two years or three years which we don't want it to happen in such cases it is ultimately important for us to preserve what is there so in such cases what we are going to do is we are going to go ahead with a post and a core build up it is nothing but a composite core and then that's how it is going to be finished okay so it is now the restorative dentist role now to design this instead of going for a full uh, fledged crown preparation now what do we have here a overlay 
the material for which we are going to prepare is going to be a all ceramic emax which is nothing but lithium disilicate glass or nowadays people or even can be done with lab composite hipc there are a lot of composites which are millable which are also available uh, or you can even do the composites for direct restoration in such cases so what we can do is we can get it from the lab in this fashion see here the distal off is not prepared here the palatal shell is retail re remaining as it is so it is important for us to know because all these are there in the prosthodontic curriculum overlay inlays onlays the principle doesn't change only thing is newer material comes uh, we need to know about the material what are the strengths and the shortcomings we need to focus on that so this is how the premolar overlay is going to be buckle overlap with the occlusal coverage okay and the cementation again it is important for us to isolate only then the bonding will be very effective and then you can go ahead and check the fit of this and then you can go ahead with the steps of preparing the tooth as well as preparing the tissue surface of the prosthesis etching and then bonding agent and then you can loop it with a self adhesive resin cements and you can cure it okay so once it is cured it is good enough you can clean and that's how the bonded restorations are going to look like now what is the biggest advantage here the minimal tooth structure reduction is what has happened and then the preservation is going to be there for the long term success more amount of natural dentin is preserved better it is for a long term success okay the general principles of prosthodontics remains the same you are going to prepare the stress bearing cusp or the functional cusp little more and your margins are not going to be there in the place where there is a occlusal contact all these remains the same the only thing is the material will be different the type of preparation will be varied according to the material of choice and then the impression making isolation is are going to be a little newer concept that we need to follow so from there to here it becomes much much more precise now we need to adapt these changes as a prosthodontist from the time of our evolution as a prosthodontist so another area where usually people tell about crowns or we ourselves have done plenty of cases where aesthetic related processes in the anterior there is always a debate uh, which i usually participate in most of the conferences metal ceramic or all ceramic crown which is better for that particular region anterior all ceramic posterior metal ceramic now they, those things are actually uh, changing now why i am saying this see in 2010 in such a case comes for uh, uh, discoloration in the anterior teeth a good metal ceramic crown will definitely be a treatment of choice is it going to be the same today or am i going to do a all ceramic crown instead of a metal ceramic crown the changes are not the same you see here the yeah, incisal class 4 uh, fracture what is that we are going to offer to the patient a all ceramic crown with endodontics with or without endodontics is that what you want to offer that's what we were doing in 2010 up to 2015 now a spacing correction this is uh, one of in my early part of practice in 2007 spacing correction what is that we can do we can take a cast we can do a diagnostic wax up you can show it to the patient and then you can prepare a crown and you can give a crown in this fashion without the, any spacing okay so these are all the ways by, by which we are changing the smile by giving crowns even proclined incisor we used to prepare only the labial portion we used to do the access preparation to through the labial portion 
and we used to do a lot of cases like this aesthetic correction by giving a crown in the anterior region is it going to be the same in the same way we are going to treat the same patients in the same way no there are newer methods now if you open the facebook or any social media today what is the treatment of option for such a broken thing direct composite restorations because this has become very predictable because of the bonding system because of the isolation because of the change in the material this has become very predictable suppose if the same thing happens with me what will i do i'll go for a crown or i'll go for a direct composite restoration obviously i'll go for a direct composite restoration if it is my brother or sister what will i do it is going to be direct composite if i am little reluctant about the direct composite restoration the next thing that i can think of is a laminate veneer for such cases not only that <coughs> a space closure like this excuse, excuse me previously we used to give a crown telling that the laminates will not be adhering to the tooth for longer time when you bite something it will come out nothing happens only thing is if the proper protocol is followed the laminate veneer gives a very good results but as a prosthodontist in the initial part of my practice i used to convert that cases into a all ceramic crowns instead of laminates nowadays i realize when i touch the tooth for more preparation i am the one who is going to face the music at a longer run because these people are going to come back to you if the crown is little loose or if the underlying tooth is broken when there is a, any problem with the endodontic it is your responsibility to treat them so it is important for us to understand all this so minimal preparation is always a better choice and you have a lot of options in a minimal preparation so from there to here it just takes few um uh, thin layers of composite veneer but it requires a lot of uh, planning a good skillful execution a good laboratory support for such things that is where we need to develop ourselves discoloration management what we can do for such cases previously i used to tell the patient about the crowns okay or bleaching nowadays it is very simple that's the intraoral view post orthodontically done so what we can do is this is a clear matrix which is nothing but polyvinyl siloxane which has been the brand name of exaclear marketed by gc so this is a very good option take the impression by directly injecting onto the patient's mouth and then you can prepare under isolation then what you can do is you can inject flowable resin there are specific resins for this particular technique injectable mono shade resins that are available which can be used very well to have a good outcome like this so you have to finish you have to polish even the surface character is going to be duplicated very nicely in such situations okay so immediate post op is going to be like this and a week later when the composite rehydrates doesn't require anything the color changes immediately this patient was having a uh, marriage within a week so we did this and she was extremely happy so this is the extra oral from here to there within a span of 2 hours everything is changed so now spacing management previously i have shown cases with i was doing myself as crowns now what is that i am going to offer to the patient do a diagnostic wax up this diagnostic wax up can be an analog one nowadays we have digital diagnostic wax up we have softwares for this digital smile designing but everything has the same concept we need to have a diagnostic wax up we can have the proper because all these are prosthodontic ornamentarium we are used to doing uh, wax ups like this so it is easier for us to do a wax up okay now what next that we can do the same way on top of this we can have a index made a clear 
index made and we can inject. That's all. So you can get the outcome as it is in the cast. So the patient will be very happy, quick. But the thing is, we need to understand this material requires little special efforts as a prosthodontist because we need to isolate, we need to have the right kind of material, and then we need to know how do we polish all this. So that is where a newer skill has to be developed. So it is already existing skills of laminate veneer preparation, all the already existing skills of doing a diagnostic wax up. Okay, what good, what looks good for the patient, definitely we will have a much better role as a prosthodontist in such situation. So, minimal preparation designs are here to stay, that we need to understand. So, it is high time that we prosthodontists should lead the way in these minimal preparation designs. Okay, it is not a aesthetic dentist role or it is not an endodontist or an operative dentist role, it is the role of prosthodontist because traditionally we have been doing all this, okay, right from what Dr. Uh, Vinod was showing from difficult cases to simplest of the cases. It is perfectly in our domain. We need to master the technique. We need to understand the material. That's how it has to be. So FPD, there are a lot of changes. No more we are going to be preparing uh, continuously all the teeth from morning to evening, only preparation, all the 24 teeth preparation, all those are gone. So in full mouth rehabilitation, what is that we are going to do today? Okay. Is it going to be an analog technique or is it going to be a digital technique? Is it going to be a conventional tooth preparation or is it going to be a minimal preparation? Let us see both. See, this is a pre-op situation. This is one of the cases which I presented in Indian Board of Prosthodontics in 2015. So this case was done in 2013 or 14 in that. So it used to be a punctuer. You used to have a lot of sensitivity. So that is where he reported to us direct pulp exposures in many of the teeth which necessitates doing a root canal treatment okay certain times we need we will be doing it a little on the overboard sometimes we will be doing root canal end up doing root canal for most of the teeth because of our preparation design which is maximum so we start with the diagnostic wax up in a as dr uh, Prakash so was saying. So this is how we do a diagnostic wax up. And then side by side, we will be doing a symptomatic teeth root canals also. And then this will be given as a removable appliance or sometimes we will do a full preparation and then we can do a temporization based on the diagnostic wax up. Here we perfect the occlusion and then we go ahead and make the final restoration as you can see in the articulator. Wax up followed by the final restoration in the articulator. Whatever we wanted to give the occlusal scheme, whether it is canine guided. Okay. So all these things will be done in the articulator and then it will be delivered to the patient. Some of, see, as you can see, most of the teeth are root canal treated. Some of the teeth which are extracted or are handled with implant placement. So that's how the gentleman ended up. So from where we started and where we ended. So this is where the, and six years down the lane. It looks good, fantastic. But the problem is not the same. As you can see here, the lateral incisor started little shaky. It had fractured. So what can be done? Are you going to replace with an implant or is it going to be a, we have went ahead and done a post and core. Then what becomes a simple process becomes much, much more complicated. And then finally, we end up placing an implant for this case. But at present, it is only as a... So the problem lists are many. One is broken lateral incisor. It will be looking good on that day so for some time, follow up. 
the failing rcts is also a thing because when you are doing rct for all the 24 teeth not all the 24 teeth is going to be the same sometimes there may be some residual lesion uh, broken instruments all those things can happen so that is why we need to avoid most of these things so that you will be uh, peaceful when you send the patient out say present day full mouth rehabilitation what is that we are in uh, it's much similar case uh, where most of the teeth are worn out with sensitivity and then with temporomandibular joint issues the third molars have been extracted that's the preoperative scan and that's the that's how the occlusion is and if you see the occlusal surface you can very well see that most of the them are are treated and you can even see the root canal uh, areas so in such cases is it necessary that we need to do a endodontic treatment first and then go for a crown not really the treatment philosophies have changed so we are going to increase the vertical dimension in such cases we don't even require to touch the occlusal surface unless otherwise you wanted to there are there are techniques to handle the uh, uh, preparations like this a minimal preparation or overlay is what is going to be planned in such cases so it starts with intraoral scanning digital mock-up including the digital smile designing and uh, that is where the photographs the scan and then followed by your occlusion uh, um, digital occlusion everything comes into play so in such cases, you will be doing a digital markup and then you will be transferring the digital markup from the printed model into the intraoral using a putty index like this. Under isolation, you will be doing a digital markup. See, after the temporization, the intraoral scan looks like this. Okay, only additive, only additive preparation and the patient will be there with this uh, bisacryl composite based temporization based on the digital uh, wax up and the printed models. So this is how the temporization is going to be. And we need to perfect the occlusion in these cases. And then we will be starting with the plan that is full ceramic crowns for previously prepared teeth. If you have noted, right posteriors are already having a bridge. So uh, no way I can go for a minimal preparation. I have to continue with it. Lower anterior and upper anterior, there is a bridge and crowns. So those things, apart from that, rest of the things are going to be minimal preparation designs like laminates and overlays. Okay. So this is the anterior preparation. This is how the anterior preparation is going to be. Three unit bridge in the anterior, upper anterior, lower two crowns. Rest of the things are going to be laminates. Okay. So that's the finished emacs processes in the printed models and then you're going to prepare the laminates for the cementation by etching the laminate the emacs and then selenization of the restoration and then etching the teeth surface as i showed previously bonding and bonding it with a resin cement so that's how uh, it is going to get finished the anterior region along with digital smile designing this will be a good thing to have so you can see very well adapted margins uh, there is no the biggest advantage of this all ceramic is the gingival response will be very very good fantastic if it is handled properly and then the right side posterior preparation as you can see upper it is going to be a full full occlusal coverage lower it is going to be a minimal preparation that is overlay in the premolar region we will also include the labial surface also that's all and then that's the uh, restoration uh, full ceramic restoration upper is going to be a emax bridge lower is going to be a emax overlay that's the preparation of the restoration side has to be done i usually have a small box with putty uh, during the setting itself i'll make it as a individual or a custom tray kind of a thing so that it will be helpful for us during the uh, treatment of the inner surface 
uh, of the restorations. So we need to have a proper isolation strategy. Then only all these, without isolation, no bonding can happen. So it is important for us to understand how the isolation has to be done. Okay. This is all new skills that needs to be developed and then etching, bonding, what kind of bonding is going to be good for such cases. These are all the things that we need to learn. We need to learn about the material and then, then that's how it is going to be cemented. That's how it's going to be looking like. Beautiful, isn't it? So not much of preparation, very minimum preparation. One side, right side is prepared. And then you can check the eccentric occlusion also. On the left hand side, uh, second quadrant, second premolar, and the second molar is going to be a direct composite. I'm not going for an indirect composite. Since on the other side, there is a bridge, we plan for a uh, Emacs. Here, we have planned for only acrylic or the uh, composite based HIPC. Uh, overlays okay so in the upper there are going to be two overlays in the lower going to be four overlays okay so that's how it is from the lab after cementation as you can see nice full contour uh, back and then how many rcts are carried out only one teeth rct is ca carried out these are all bonuses so all the other things are not root canal treated. Vitality is maintained. And then patient was instructed about the periodontal health and not much of preparation done. Okay, no sensitivity, no post-op sensitivity. And it is the way to treat. Suppose if it is your father or mother, this is how the occlusal surface is going to look like from here to here okay so that's how is it going to be an analog which is going to be the best or the digital which is going to be the best the technique remains the same what material are going to be used how you are going to be used see only when you know about the analog technique going into the digital technique becomes an easier way otherwise it is going to be even there you can incorporate a lot of uh, false readings uh, because they come these computer doesn't know x y z they only know their language okay as you are instructing the lab you cannot instruct the uh, computer if the preparation is not adequate it is going to say i cannot mill so it is important for us to understand all this only when you uh, refine your techniques in the analog going into digital becomes much much more easier so now tell me which one you would prefer if it is your own father or mother is it going to be conventional one or is it going to be the minimal preparation one as you can make out it is your choice and it my choice is always minimal preparation because i don't want to go for a conventional uh, endo and crown for most of the things. So we talked about two things, right? One is the FPD, one is the FMR, full motor rehabilitation. Implant supported process or implant process, which we, we, are, we are routinely doing every day as a consultant process. Okay. Previously, this is how we are going to do. Take one uh, stock abutment from, from the lab or the company provided attach it make a crown metal ceramic or all ceramics meant it that's how i've been practicing all these years for the past few years the scenes have been changed this is how the screw retained crowns are being fabricated custom we i was thrilled to see a screw retained crown in 2007 with a custom uh, made wax pattern and things like that at that time it was looking very good no customized apartment we took picture with the cell phone so that's how we were in 2007 now the completed restoration but this patient was kept on complaining about sir it is getting struck frequent screw loosening okay so these are all the issues then i started thinking what is that wrong we have given the ultimate option of implant 
and a screw retained crown those days with the limited uh, material and the lab support giving a screw retained crown is uh, something which is amazing so not not anymore uh, the problems are excessive buckle and the lingual overlap like this and then that acts as a food trap inability to clean that area when the food is getting trapped people used to use so many things to remove it right so that is when the screw loosening also happens the height of the processes is very very minimum what do we do in such situation we have options now today of newer implant designs which is which involves placing it subcrustally or supracrustally at the level of the gingiva there are so many implant design coming up today and the processes will be dealt accordingly it is not going to be a singular design which were existing previously according to the implant design the processes design changes and then the most important factor is when you wanted to replace two central incisor you customize the gingiva so everything the uh, the emergence profile is so very customized in today's world that's when it appears near natural this problems of buckle or lingual overlap foot getting underneath all these things can be prevented to a larger extent a real master class prosthesis can be delivered in such situations let us see a molar replacement is actually a case where we have three unit uh, all ceramic uh, bridge which was cemented a month before fractured you know the reason the why it is fractured it is basically because the connector height is only 3 3.5 mm which is prone for and obviously have no idea about the occlusion little on the higher side so it got fractured exactly in the connector on both the sides okay patient came to me and we offered implant solution customized the healing collar so that for these less spaces lay say 3 mm or 3.5 mm can be handled the broken pontic is used as a uh, the uh, diagnostic wax up and then on the tissue side we took a putty index made a custom healing collar placed at the time of surgery itself okay a custom healing collar placed at the time of surgery itself see how beautifully it healed after the 3 months now it looks like there is a molar teeth which is already extracted beautiful gingival contouring is already done okay now making a prosthesis becomes much much more simplified the lab also knows where the gingiva is going to be how the gingiva and the prosthesis is going to be and then now you can see how good gingival cuff is formed in the edentulous feature no problem of food accumulation maintenance becomes much much more easier it's not going to come out so frequently because it is managed from the emergence see the change from where it was and how it is now so we need to adapt these newer materials newer methods again composites are here again index making is coming and again our own fortrite fortress is diagnostic wax up all these are handled well only thing is this diagnostic wax up is meeting newer material newer technologies newer methods so that you will get a good ideal prosthesis as dr vinod was telling we will have a beautiful emergence profile and beautiful direction of occlusal forces this will definitely serve a longer time and then the whole world is now towards the guided sensor as a prosthodontist if you lack a little bit of surgical skill guided surgery is a fantastic option as vinod was showing splitting and other things those things are not well uh, adapted by the guided surgery unfortunately but if you have good clear bone if you want to place implants without much of risk in accordance to the final prosthesis 
then guided surgery is the way guided surgery is not for experienced operator guided surgery is for newer people like you new implantologists new prosthodontists who wants to make big in implantology that is where guided surgery is helpful here is a case he is a colleague of mine fourth year he is a world surgeon in fact and then his two teeth though it appears well you can see some grayish discoloration some laminates was done years before crowns were done years before for aesthetic correction as i showed previously okay not by me and these tooth has external root resorption okay external root resorption which necessitates removal so what did we do how do we proceed planning stage we start with a intraoral scanning which i already showed with and then cbct and then i am not going to discuss how we are going to plan but we will be ready with a surgical guide and a temporary prosthesis surgical guide will be based on the prosthesis planning that i have we have given based on that we will be having a temporary prosthesis ready even before the surgery itself okay so that is very important so you have everything ready so he is going to come in we are going to do a extraction intramatically that's the guide and that's how it fits intraorally and then there will be uh key holes with the different dill dimensions and you are going to prepare through it now it is anybody's game yeah, experience doesn't have any role here but for planning you need experience we can have ideal prosthetic emergence ideal implant emergence okay and then you can place the implant also through the stent surgical guide itself so now it is time for us to take over the temporization this is the shell temporary made by uh, printing technology from the proposed treatment plant even for the adjacent central incisor we have made a crown the central and lateral we have made a shell which is going to be customized according to this okay that's how the final crown is going to be a screw retained crown okay customized on top of the shell which is obtained pre operatively so guided surgery is done relined cat cam temporaries which is milled temporaries or printed temporaries both it can be but in this case it is a milled temporaries so central incisor cent, uh, crown is being been replaced the other two central incisor which is immediate extraction immediate placement and immediate loaded okay patient came in like this walk out like this so nobody can make out especially uh the kids and other person who is uh, in the home they didn't even realize that such thing had happened that's how the comfort of this procedure the plan has to be done in such a way okay this is how it looks after the 3 weeks now if i show you the occlusal surface see the emergence how beautifully it is being healing and then you can also see some traces of the uh, regenerative materials that is bone graft that is used so beautifully customized and that's how the prosthesis today is going to be okay now we have seen from where we were in a uh implant supported situation prosthesis wise and where we are today okay this has to be implemented in our training period itself so that when we come out we will be ready for the prosthesis and then the complete denture the fourth category what do we do uh, in complete denture because a lot of people go for consultation for complete uh, complete denture prosthesis how it is going to be different from there in 2000 this is my exam case uh, uh this is one of the relatives of dr uh, your principal dr sharata sogan and we have done a complete denture at that time i was do, doing my post graduation there and then we had a, a idea of uh, doing a 
little bit of customization of gingiva those days we used to use uh, burnt umber color mix it with the monomer pack it during the packing stage and we used to try out all this at that time it was looking so good but if i see now i will be laughing at it that's how it was in 2000 20 years later i don't think any future in this so but there are changes in the material in the lab aspect because the uh, the gingival contour the type of processing uh, type of material nowadays even uh, digital dentures digital complete dentures are all there printed dentures cat cam related dentures are all there in the market it is available even in india it is available uh, so what what is that changed not only the type of uh, material for the teeth the denture based material the denture based characterizing and it becomes much much more easier today to characterize which we were struggling those days okay there are composites which are come out like this beautiful denture is it you can customize the gingiva according to the patient okay that's how the complete denture in 2021 is and the natural appearing prosthesis we can deliver apart from occlusion apart from everything a good retention a good appearance is what is more important okay the same thing can be utilized in the full mouth rehabilitation cases in the implant full mouth rehabilitation whatever we have discussed till now everything comes into play a full arch rehabilitation with the teeth with the implant almost the same only thing is here we can decide where we want our abutment support needs to be so this is how we were doing in 20 2008 it was uh we yeah highly compromised uh, situation failing dentition periodontally compromised at least two times they have done a periodontal surgery for this case finally we resorted to implant stage by stage those days we were little reluctant on placing the implant loading it immediately the type of implant the type of prosthesis is all the same okay so what is that this is how in 2007 it was um, we have uh, delivered the prosthesis patient was extremely happy on that day now if i see this is it looking very aesthetic no way no way near the present standard but still it was all eight implants on the maxilla on the mandible metal ceramic prosthesis cemented till now patient is coming for but the only problem is some of the molar region there is little fracture if i have to cut open i have to cut open the entire thing she also accepted as it is so this is how it is today okay so from cemented prosthesis to a screw retain complete prosthesis today what is the if the same kind of case comes how we are going to handle we are not going to venture into implant placement straight away we have to make sure that the patient understand the need for periodontal uh, uh, maintenance and when these kind of people walk in they never use brush because they know that it is all loose and it is all painful they never use brush from the day if you are going to convert everything into a fixed implant supported as dr uh, uh, vinod was showing in two days sometimes the patient may not be able to perform the routine maintenance that's what i observe in my practice so even if she is not or he is not maintaining the periodontal status the onus falls on us so what i am doing nowadays is i am going to extract all this in periodontally compromised cases we are not going to place the implant immediately if it is restorative compromised cases i can go ahead and place immediately and then we have to see the general health of the patient also uh, so that we can plan well with the temporary denture again the planning is the key with intraoral scanning photograph and then digital planning uh, along with the cbct we will be able to do a better plan if you want to make a stent for a full arch restoration 
it is difficult not fully foolproof usually for full arch restoration i am going ahead with only uh, hand placement not guided surgeries and then immediately we can give on the extraction four to six weeks later implant placement immediately within two days as uh, dr vinod was showing we can convert the uh, temporary denture into a hybrid prosthesis after four to six weeks later we have to evaluate for what kind of final prosthesis sometimes it is going to be hybrid itself sometimes it is going to be a removable one sometimes it is going to be a titanium framework with zirconia crown my job dr vinod has already done here okay what kind of prosthesis that is the choice for each and every patient individually depending on their bite force depending on the alveolar bone loss it is going to be okay this is how it is going to be after the four months time after the extraction implant placement and temporary prosthesis see how ideal distribution is this may not be possible on the very same day if you are going to extract and place okay now just see the final restoration titanium framework is there on top of that all ceramic crown the gingival part which we are taken it from the complete denture part we are going to use a uh, customizable composite wear restorations which is are available freely today we can customize it according to the gingival color of that particular patient also called as nolo prosthesis this is the intraoral view after fixing it that's the final from where we started and that's the extraoral view okay doesn't look like a prosthesis at least to me because i have done so i know that it is a prosthesis so which one is your choice cemented or a screw retained of this one even cemented can be done with this kind of thing but the material of choice and how do we handle the tissues is going to be the different and that's how today's prosthesis is going to be in a full mode rehabilitation okay again another case which one is a crown it's all crown it's all full implant supported prosthesis along with the digital smile designing we are able to give a good proper outcome is the lower seen here lower not at all seen just see how, how much is the height of the lower prosthesis okay vinod was uh, dr vinod was showing in one of the slide how much only basal bone is there but still we are able to give a fixed screw retain prosthesis but only thing is we have to make sure that they clean properly so what we discussed today or one is fpd in that fpd crown versus minimal preparation okay minimal preparations are here to stay don't do for smile designing crowns those are all outdated okay so what has to be done a proper planning interdisciplinary planning nowadays we are using uh more of orthodontics also for smile designing finally we are finishing with with a laminates and then in full mouth rehabilitation we have traditional wax up and then converting that wax up into a temporary and a fixed rest, temporary restoration and then moving on to with a uh, articulator and uh, full mouth rehabilitation with crowns with or without endodontics and then traditional and then the newer minimal preparation designs like your veneers overlays veneer lays and those things are becoming much much more important because patient acceptance is also good because you are it is not going to be cheaper but the thing is patient acceptance is you are not going to get many root canals done you are not going to face root canal failures in the implant prosthesis we saw about customizing the gingiva customizing the emergence profile that is part and parcel of every prosthodontic or bacterium and then complete denture prosthesis lot have been changed from digital dentures to changing the contour of the dentures a better materials and then in everything including including all this becomes our implant supported full mode rehabilitation okay so this is where we are today are we ready as a prosthetic dentist when we come out are we ready to treat cases like this that is the question that we need to answer we need to develop the newer skill sets like documentation 
because most of my work previously most of my work today i was able to appreciate because of my documentation i don't have to spend lakhs and lakhs in uh, updating my knowledge if i see sit through my documented cases in 2007 to 2021 2001 to 2021 20 years if i have a documentation now i can clearly understand where i was where i was lacking where what all the things that i need to improve and then communication with the fellow colleagues like you are uh, surgeons like you are implant uh, implant surgeons and then periodontist orthodontist the documentation is the king the moment you start documenting all the other uh, fellow colleagues other departments also fall in line they will be able to give you the best solution that is possible so documentation is the major part photo video anything you can do and you can also promote yourself that is minor thing but most important thing is documentation will make you to learn a lot of things knowledge about the material especially composites we need to learn as a prosthodontist we will say for a composite is not my material right uh, it is not in the curriculum no it is it is our material we, we need to know about that and then newer materials like your denture based materials uh the uh the lab material so much things have changed the digital technology has taken over the lab part entirely which i have not spoken here scanning part intraoral scanning lab scanning planning part exocad dental wings so many softwares are there and then how are you going to use that software those are all the things that we need to learn and then fabrication method is it going to be a printed one or is it going to be a cad cam milled one additive technology or subtractive technology so many things have changed now all the labs are slowly changing it into a digital digital labs very rare it is tough for any lab to survive with analog technology that's how it is today and then isolation rubber dam placement and then bonding those are all the things that we need to understand because without understanding that we may not be able to do a good full mouth because everybody wants to have their hands on full mouth rehabilitation because that is where money is the everybody wants to become a smile designer so if you wanted to do one of these then we need to change our skill set or learn the new skill set so that it will be better for you so that you will be employable from the day one when you come out of your masters There's something called as a knowledge doubling time, which I wanted to share you people. So why this is important? See, yeah, a century before, in 1900, the knowledge doubling time is a century. That is, if you read something in nineteen thousand, you can uh, cross the entire century on high. If you know something, say one Veda, you know. uh one sloga you know one method of uh, fabrication you know you can pass on you can complete your entire life time with that particular knowledge now what happened in 1945 the knowledge doubling because the information is so much that knowledge doubling is happens much faster that means you will become outdated in 25 years time that is when at the time when we got independence most of the time usually for any dentist suppose if he has uh, mastered or a technique in uh, 1970s or 1960 next to 25 30 years he don't have to update he can still do the same thing extraction rpd cd he can pass the entire lifetime as a dentist without changing anything but will it be the same in 19 uh 80s and i think the knowledge doubling every 13 months that means every year there is a doubling in 2020 20 or it is going to be knowledge doubling that means new things are happening every day every day we are unable to keep a track of it but 
if you are going to lack this perception if you are not going to understand that the world is changing continuously newer technologies are coming we need to adapt it if you are not going to lag if you are going to lag in this knowledge doubling time and you are expertise in understanding these things then we may not be able to survive the entire lifetime as a dentist or as a prosthodontist that's the take home message people and uh, it is easy today to lag behind as the science is advancing rapidly but at the same time you have a positive also good thing that you have a possibility of overtaking me or any of the senior colleagues very easily because you people know how it has to be how how the digital technology works because you you are uh, born with that aptitude uh, we call it millennials right uh, the newer uh, bds people you were born after 2000 90s kid and 2000 millennials they all know the digital technology very well because they are today uh for me connecting a zoom is a big thing but you people are learning through the uh, digital platform so it is easier for you to overtake old people like me very easily and you can move forward that's a take home message knowledge doubling time is a take home message and it is favorable for you people rather than people at 40 like me right so i would like to acknowledge the wonderful opportunity handed over to me to speak uh, with my budding prosthodontist future prosthodontist future dentist thank you one and all so uh, i should thank dr matthew the head of the department department of prosthodontics the name can change as a restorative dentist also implantologist also implant department also we don't know what is in future as of today department of prosthodontics crown and bridge ksr dental college and to my teachers dr e muniratnam naidu and all my students who made me a teacher today and uh, my clinic team for documenting each and every case and uh, my patients who were very patient with me when we document things and they when we explain things they follow us and uh, they uh with little doubts or other things they will obey to most of the treatment plan that we uh put forward whether it is newer treatment plan or a word older treatment plan that's why i was able to show so i should thank my patients for uh uh being with me so for any queries you can contact me on this mail id diadinadan@gmail.com thank you one and all it is over to you sir thank you so much dr sendil uh, i'm so glad that uh, we didn't stick on with the uh, implant topic as uh, suggested earlier and we went on with what you suggested uh, it's quite scary when you think about this uh, knowledge doubling time <laughs> come down to 12 hours no how you can like, uh, easily overtake the other person definitely and, uh, it thanks, is true yeah thanks uh, down the lane in another 5 years there will be so many professors ready uh with uh, phd's uh that is how it is it, it, we don't have to be scared sir but the advantage that we have is we know the analog technology very well the foundation is very strong even if you are going digital if you don't know the foundation of how do we wax up uh only with computer you cannot do if you know the wax up analog way then making a digital wax up becomes easier otherwise you uh, you will be lost uh, it is like running a, a temple run game no uh, you will fall every time uh, and you have to get up again and do but when you are doing it in the processes uh the price that uh, being digital is on the higher side so uh, when you have no the analog technology uh it is easier for us to shift from analog to digital way that is all but digital is not uh going to be um economical definitely it is not going to be economical 
but the thing is it will be the way forward because the way mobiles have changed the way uh the way we take photographs have changed I hope you can understand sir uh in our department we used to have one uh d one camera uh, by dr naidu sir who has dedicated one camera to the lab and we used to have floppy disk and one desktop if you take two or three picture uh, it will be full and for us to take go and unload it in the computer and come back by the time it will be one hour okay uh, and then the patient will be uh, restless and the next patient will be waiting so we will not be able to document our cases uh, that's that's how it was but today everybody is having one mobile in their hand and then not only uh, the dentists the patients they are also having mobile in their hand they will be able to critically acclaim the processes okay and then they can give a critical remark on the social media so that's the <laughs> way it is now hmm? so we have to so uh, sendil thanks again for uh, breaking up it into components i think almost as five components and uh, elaborately speaking on that and uh, uh, driving in the point that how important it is you know, to keep evolving uh, as technology changes and how important this documentation part is because i think it's very important to self assess yourself down the years you don't have to look at others you you just have to see yourself how much you have changed whether whether you evolved whether you using the technology i think it's very very important uh, point that you made and uh, i don't know if there are other questions i would i just uh, are there questions yeah uh, i just wanted to ask one question uh, maybe we all been taught that uh, once a tooth is endodontically treated uh you go ahead and give a crown because you want to uh, hold the entire tooth to be integrated uh, from breaking off uh, that's one point and how do you uh, choose your cases because uh for me it's easy to understand that if you have a little bit of a foundation like if it's for a full mouth rehab for a patient who's got a treated teeth you have substantial amount of dentin or uh, enamel uh, which is already there as a foundation but in case it's a endodontically treated teeth and this uh, the one of the first cases that you showed uh, a premolar which had just the shell of the enamel alone very little bit of dentin in between how is this uh, how, how would it be successful uh, in case you give uh, bonded restoration like how you said how do you cho choose your cases um that's a very good question first of all when i heard that endodontically treated teeth doesn't require a crown it is a shocking thing every day practice revolves around that uh not only me as a consultant prosthodontist many of our students go as consultant for preparing the teeth which is endodontically treated now when when i started listening to this it is it is tough for me to understand but it really works uh and there are a lot of evidences also today only thing that we as a prosthodontist fail to understand is how it has to be done uh, it is not the same way it is not going to be uh, see actually making a crown is much simpler making a direct restoration is much much more complex but biggest advantage is for the patient why because it is a adhesive technology because the bonding system has evolved so much how the bond happens with enamel is been very very successful 20 23 years before how the bond is with the dentin is what is transformed this adhesive dentistry previously i never used to dare to do a laminate veneer which is going to be stripped on to a enamel surface uh when people came for smile designing in 2008 i right royally refused to do a laminate veneer i will say i will go for a crown okay all ceramic crown probably metal ceramic crown was the tick of action for me i believed in metal ceramic crown for me to change to a all ceramic crown it took some time say lava 2011 and 
when i started seeing the gingival response for a metal ceramic and all ceramic i started changing that is where documentation has come into play if i see the invariably all the metal ceramic crown with a layer of metal and the opaque layer which is there very near to the dentin invariably there will be a plaque accumulation there will be a marginal gingivitis the same thing will not happen with the all ceramic restoration you can see your own cases so that's the uh, success point for me so from then onwards it is mostly all ceramic i leave the option to the patient you want the traditional methodology you want the newer methodology both are not going to be the same okay that is when the documentation comes you give the option to the patient because uh, i won't say uh, doing a root canal and a crown is a bad thing it is a documented evidence based procedure till today okay for the premolar crown give the option to the patient you want a, uh, this kind of a restoration wherein we are going to believe in the adhesion we are going to use newer materials we are going to use newer technologies there the evidences are there for shorter time not for longer time it is for them to decide i will execute in the same way today also for the same uh, case i am doing metal ceramic crown also but the thing is a informed decision made by the patient but if they ask me which one you choose doctor if it is my own brother or sister i will be choosing the minimal preparation design because how many times i would have seen a uh, endodontically treated post and core especially premolar and lateral incisor fractured and come okay so that is the time i realized these things would be a better option the moment i started understanding the bonding the moment i started uh, doing a conservative preparation and isolation it works really well initial part when we do a uh, aesthetic core aesthetic post and core okay without isolation it used to come out at the time when i cement the metal ceramic crown i hope everybody would have had the same experience i used to wonder these people are showing right left and center all these works for them why it is not working for us we are also using the same kind of material then i understood it is to do with isolation so when i started isolating i need to understand much better about isolating and uh, one big advantage which i have is i also do uh, endo for myself uh, not for all the cases at least for some cases i used to do so i used to understand it much better uh, so it is that way so uh, if for your question still i am doing both the things it is up to the patient to take up which one they want because both are uh, uh, evidence based uh, dentistry thank you dr sendil uh, i don't think we have any questions on the uh, zoom platform do you have anything on this one one question Yes, yes, I am ready to. Uh, Sir, answer. can you explain us again about the uh, customized fabrication of that uh, gingival cuff, cuffing for that molar case that you have shown for the implant? Uh, very good question. Um, see, first thing that we need to have is a um, backup is necess necessary. Since this is a broken bridge, I used. the existing pontic of that bridge as a wax up okay now what i did is on the tissue side i took a uh, putty index okay on the middle of that i have to place an implant okay i am not going to use a regular healing cap there are temporary abutments that are available in each and every company you mentioned every company will have uh, a temporary abutment thing is if you know that then you just make a hole in the center of the putty index place your temporary abutment use a flowable composite around you will get a custom made healing cap okay if you are able to do that that is that is the first step okay and then for anterior restoration it is very common nowadays uh, we are not uh, using a stock abutment see they gone are those days with only one implant one stock abutment one healing cap it is not that way 
temporary uh, abutments will be there so all those are also part and parcel of a uh, good clinical outcome okay now if it is your mother or some, your own uh, kith and kin you would like to do this or not you have wanted to have a good outcome as a gingival outcome a good gingival cuff that is well so if that is convinced then don't worry about the charges for the material anyway the patient is going to pay the only thing is you need to be equipped with all these components you need to be equipped with this material the traditional prosthodontics is there for us to help okay since we do most of the cases we will take a study cast we will do a diagnostic wax up we will do a surgical guide on top of the diagnostic wax it becomes easier for us to understand all this okay this was one of the answer we were searching for the frequent school loosening problem Actually, I got a, one valuable reason for it. <laughs> See, uh, screw loosening, uh, the implants also have changed. That also we need to accept. See, we started with single piece Meenakshi implant. Hope you can, uh, Dr. Matthew and Dr. Vinod can uh, come uh, talk about that. We started with a single piece implant. What you uh, what is there today as a cortical implant? We started with that. whether you like or don't like all the cases are loaded immediately okay that is where we started now then we moved on to some expensive systems not so expensive systems uh, and then is it the same system occupying today no there are better implant designs better there are better implant abutment connections for so that you we will have a better process ultimately i am a prosthodontist though i do surgical work but i am a prosthodontist i have to deliver a good prosthesis at the end if i am um, if i am able to do a good surgery it doesn't matter patient doesn't even know if i am able to give a good all on for prosthesis then only the patient understands okay my fellow colleagues understands if i am going to give a prosthesis which looks uh, not so uh, presentable you know, for them to have a selfie then it is not the prosthesis which i have to deliver so uh, that much i am very clear so today materials have changed components have changed lab support changed tremendously when i was in my post graduation i was about to do a study on implant impression but i was unable to do you know why i was unable to get the component for a open a tra- open open tray transfer i am unable to get that's how it was in 2020 so 2000 2002 2003 it is not the case today we have uh, digital impression copings today so uh, that's how the world is moving very fast only thing is we need to adapt to the change as a prosthodontist so that it will be easier for us to move forward uh, uh, sendil i think uh, uh, dr deepa has got a question uh, good Good, good afternoon, Dr. Deepa. You can go good ahead. Afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, Sandil, I have a doubt because it was in my own mouth, so I have a lot of doubt about it. <laughs> <laughs> See, because I had a class too. Okay, mm-hmm. so the endodontist had done a good RCT, and he has managed to give a good restoration also. So my doubt is, when you talk about the adhesive restoration that can be given. Uh, for a class 2 restoration especially uh, giving an adhesive restoration uh, my doubt is in, on the opposing plunger cusp when it comes and uh, contacts the restoration will the restoration will be able to take that amount of forces number 1 number 2 is can you create the proper emergence profile which is required because that is very important for preventing food impaction especially on the lingual or the palatal areas in the case of a maxillary molar because the lower cusp comes and hits it and immediately the foot goes and it gets impacted on the palatal aspect of the gingiva that was thing happened to me so i had lot of questions about this so how do you manage to get a proper emergence profile under a, uh, that is when you given adhesive restoration especially thank you thank you so much for questioning me Uh, uh for the benefit of others dr deepa is my fellow batchmate in my post graduation and we worked together uh 
now she is there as a professor in uh, uh, one of the dental colleges in Coimbatore. We regularly meet. Uh, thank you, Deepa, for coming across and spending some time. Now, going into this, that is where I said there is a change in the terminology. Okay, the terminology is restorative dentist. Okay, if I if somebody is doing a root canal, somebody else is going to restore the teeth, then it will be a tough choice. See, subgingival margins or subgingival uh, caries is the reason for your uh, problem. Class two or class three doesn't uh, make a difference. Subgingival restoration. Previously, uh, if you remember, our doctor Naidu sir used to say. If it is subgingival, only two things. You make sure that the margin is down there in the gingiva, under the gingiva, on the sound tooth structure, or it has to be on a cast restoration, right? These were the exact words told by Dr. Naidu. But that was true at that time. But today, we are doing something called as a marginal elevation. Elevation of the margin. That is the first requirement, even before I start, the preparation of for the root canal first of all i need to know where the margin is a bite wing is an important tool there okay before i could start the uh, root canal treatment i would assess where the margin is okay with a bite wing radiograph that is critical if it is sub gingival the next thing that I have to assess, will I be able to retract the gingiva? It is all in the domain of prosthodontics. If you are able to make a good retraction with your uh, retraction card, which we used to do uh, when we are doing a uh, full coverage restoration, hmm? that is where I should thank Dr. Naidu. Each and every case he used to do gingival retraction. The same thing he holds good here also. Okay. So where the margin is, and then, then the margin elevation, there are newer materials like flowable composites, which are with higher filler content. And then the matrices and the uh, interdental aids are entirely different today. And then we make sure that the axis is so small or so conservatively planned, unlike the previous one where we wanted to have a full straight axis it is not so now uh, with little bit of uh, magnification all these things comes into play okay this is what i wanted to try to project see if it is for our own reason we are finding it all these for ourselves okay when the same thing is for a patient it is our duty to give the same kind of care for each and every patient that we treat the next thing that I you asked was uh, the material of choice. See, the Emax is the material of choice here, or the composite restoration is the material of choice here, direct composite. See here, what is the megapascal of the compressive strength? It doesn't matter. What matters is how well it is able to bond to the tooth structure. If it is able to bond to the tooth structure much better, if it is having the same modulus of elasticity as the tooth structure, most often the bond will be very secure. And moreover, it will abrade in the same way as the natural tooth structure. That is where I am moving more towards Emax than Zirconia. Okay, where the modulus of elasticity is on the higher, and then it is not going to abrade in the same way. Just consider this as a newer tooth material, that is all. It is bonded, that is all. The bond we need to believe, we are unable to believe because we have not seen a good bond. That is all. Uh, thank you, thank answered. you. Thank you, thank you. From my uh, PG days till today, whenever I present, I get a question from Dr. Deepa. No, this was a question in my mind for the past one month because I had a tough situation and my endodontist was very grateful. I should be very grateful to him because yes, now yes. I'm able to eat. When this comes to us, I know the great difficulty of the patient because they yes. don't know how to explain it also because yes. we are going to need, we can explain it, but they cannot explain this. So now I understood a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's good to know, sir. They'll know the, the PG bonding is still there. Yes, sir. 
She's still there with you. Yeah. Still you there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Deepa, for the question. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, sir. Yeah. I don't think we have uh, any other questions on uh, chat also. That is uh, YouTube also. So uh, I think we'll uh, uh, go on with the presentation of the certificate uh, of appreciation, uh, Dr. Sena. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Sethil, can you see that? Yes, please. sir, I can see that. So please accept our uh, appreciation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank sir. Thank you so much for the thought-provoking talk. So just before ending, I just uh, want to say, please your feedback link on the uh, Zoom uh, chat. And uh, we'll be sending the uh, link uh, to your uh, emails because we couldn't send it through the uh, YouTube. We'll uh, send it through the email. Uh, please do uh, send us a feedback. Uh, uh, that will be helpful for, uh, for us. And uh, I wish to again thank uh, all the speakers for uh, spending your valuable time and uh, enlightening us. And uh, thank all the participants who uh, come for the event. And uh, I would now wish to uh, call upon Dr. Vidya Shankari to give the uh, vote of thanks. Um, uh, un unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, all. So first, let me thank, uh, give, uh, give a glorious thank to the Supreme Power for making the CDA program a successful one. I thank our uh, vice chairman, Mr. Srinivasan, in his absentia, principal, Dr. Saratha Shogun, and our respected HOD, Dr. C.A. Matthew, for uh, giving their immense support. A special thanks to our resource faculties, Dr. Prakash, Dr. Vinod Krishnan, and Dr. Sandhanathan, for accepting our invitation and uh, sharing their knowledge very well and thankful for uh, hosting, uh, having such a wonderful people today. It was really an astounding presentation. I thank all the participants and the colleagues from our department. And a special thanks to Dr. Prasad for his technical support. And uh, we have to extend our thanks to Dr. Deepika and Dr. Biju for their constant untiring work and also our PGs of our department for helping us to host this program and make it a wonderful, victorious one. Thank you all. Thank you again. Jai Hind. Thank you, Dr. Vidya. So uh, I would appreciate, as far as what uh, Dr. Prakash said, you, those who are interested could, could go ahead and uh, connect with him maybe on the uh, 17th of October. And uh, the rest of you, in case you have any queries also, I think there was a little bit of a lag in the uh, YouTube uh, link. Uh, so in case there are any queries also, uh, you could uh, share it with us. Uh, you could send it to the uh, numbers through which we have sent you the what, WhatsApp uh, uh, invite. So you could send it through that. Uh, so I think we will uh, end the, me uh, the meeting here. Uh, thank you once again. And so we need a screenshot, sir. So I ask everyone to open okay. the videos. Yeah, yeah. Turn the videos. If you could just uh, switch on your videos, we just need a, a screenshot of the uh, images. Yeah. Is that okay, Mahesh? Still more, still more people has to come. Is that okay, Mahesh? Yes, sir. 
So thank you everyone once again. I think uh, we would uh, leave the meeting as of now. So in case you have any queries, you could uh, send it across. Please do. Thank you. Thank you, sir.